Hey, Judith. Hi, Mary. Thank you. Hello. Hey, Patrick. How are you, my friend? Doing pretty good. I'm eating good. some popcorn. I'll, I'll, I will save you the visual. <laughs> it's good to see you. Good to see you too. Amy, good to Amy's here. I don't know Mini Mob. Barb, Mary Claire. Hello, Elliot. Hi, Barbara. Hi, Judith. How are you doing? Okay, I was just thinking about you the other day and missing getting to chat with you. I know. Me too. Can we have coffee sometime? <laughs> On Zoom. On Zoom. Oh, well, we could. Okay. Hello, Dennis. Hi, Judith. How are you? Good. It's nice to see you. Yeah. Hello, Barb. Hello. I'm good, to see, good to see you. Echo thing. Can you hear it? I can. Okay. Well, when Amy comes back, I'll whatever. Hi, Claudia. I'm here. Oh, hey, Barb. <laughs> good to see you. Made it on time. Thank you for getting me here. <laughs> oh, yeah.
Currently, we are still in the digital setting, but and this is almost the anniversary of when we began st uh, the digital setting of everything on Zoom, but we wanted to make acknowledgement and um, offer a space for one of our PSET members uh, for Black History Month to share a poem he worked on in his, in his project as an ambassador with Word is Bond um, in opening up uh, this meeting and sort of recognizing the space that we're in in each of our different locations <laughs> and also um, the importance of Black History Month, the importance of Black stories. And it's also um, ironically, or not ironically, but um, also the anniversary of the uh, murder of Ahmed Arby at the hands of uh, the McMichaels um, father and son. And so we are also paying um, homage to that with this. So Jamari, you have the floor. I should also have checked to make sure Damari was here. <laughs> Apologies. If he's not. Okay, it, doesn't look, it doesn't look like he's here. I do have the poem, but if he comes, then I will um, save space at the end for it to happen as well then. Um, he, did, excuse me, did he, was he okay with us sharing his poem? Uh, he said he'll be coming, so I assume I that we could just do it at the end. And, and when he gets here, I just feel like it'll be better if he shares it, it's his words and stuff. But that's okay. Um, we can start now and we'll um, come back to it at the end. So just starting with introductions, my name is Aji Chesmit, he, him, uh, co-chair of PSEF, and I'll send it to Elliot. Elliot Young, co-chair of uh, PSEP, he, him, pronouns, and I'll send it to Anne. Hi, everyone. Anne Campbell, secretary of PSEP, and I will send it to Amy. Hello, everyone. This is Amy Anderson. I am co-chair of the Behavioral Health Subcommittee, and so I'm going to send it to Vadim. Hi, everybody. Good to see you all virtually. Uh, Vadim Azurski, uh, PSEP member, uh, Settlement Agreement and Policy Subcommittee as well. And um, I will send it to... I don't seem to have the full list. Uh, Britt? Sure, thanks, Vadim. Hi, everyone. Good to be with you tonight. Uh, my name is Britt, and I he him pronouns, and I'm a member of the youth subcommittee. And I will send it to Yolanda. Thanks, Britt. Uh, my name is Yolanda Salguero, and I am a PSET member, and I uh, work with the behavioral health subcommittee. I'm trying to look for folks' names. Is Marcia on? Don't be able to join us today. I think that might be it for the um, members. Maybe we could do the Claudia and, and Judith. Okay. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Thank you for being with us this evening. My name is Claudia Claudio, and I am the project assistant for PISA. And then Judith? Sorry. Hi, everybody. My name is Judith Mowry. I use she, her pronouns, um, and I am part-time staff support also for the Peace Center. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, so we are now just going to get started with uh, subcommittee reports, starting with the steering committee. Um, what's been going on and lumped into the steering committee is also the core patrol work as it sort of is under that uh, larger purview. Uh, in core patrol, we have the feedback open till the 28th. I think it was previously open until the 12th. And so we've extended that. Um, they've also made some of the adjustments to the um, application form that community members were expressing concern over, um, like the optional name. Uh, and if you needed to put any information sort of giving you uh, telling you how you can use sort of aliases if you don't want to put any personal information. Um, we so far have received about 106 uh, submissions from that, which is getting good. It's it's sort of increasing as it's going on. And, and we've also been having an extension out, extensive outreach efforts um, from the staff and from the mayor's policy advisor who's been working with us on this. 
Um, I don't have like a number, but it's, it's they've been reaching um, community organizations, neighborhood associations, business associations, and uh, the list that Amici provided, we've been going through that and getting those organizations aware of the core patrol work that we're doing and the feedback we're trying to solicitate. Uh, then the last thing is that, well, there'll be a town hall on the 4th. Uh, of March that will be focused on core patrol. Uh, we'll ho hopefully, I'm not going to sort of, there's no definitive structure yet, but we're thinking of doing a panel and then opening it up for more feedback uh, from the community at that time. And other stuff, we had our retreat postponed because of the power outages. And so that'll be rescheduled to hopefully March or April sooner uh, rather than later. And we've been having, uh, we've been planning to have a third party mediator um, from OEHR, hopefully supporting us as well. Um, and then we also had the unfortunate resignation of one of our PSEP members, Kia Myers Duggan, um, who had a who had capacity issues. Um, she noted for the reason for her departure. Unfortunately, she was heading a lot of the work with TRC, which um, I will now throw it to the TRC. Well, we are, uh, Taji and I are heading up that effort after um, Kia Myers Dugan left us. Um, she was an incredible leader and it's a big loss to piece up. Um, we are consulting with PSU and others to determine our next steps. And we will be sharing something uh, within the next few weeks on our um, movement on T TRC. Thank you. Just one thing addition on the steering committee question on core patrol. We are planning to have another meeting prior to the town hall. Um, and I don't know, Tachi, if that's been scheduled, but if it has not been scheduled, then we will put, post it on the website and send it out to the people who've expressed an interest in core patrol. If you do have an interest in core patrol, and you're not on that list, please send your email to um, Claudia or any of us and we'll make sure that you hear about that meeting. And for the Truth and Reconciliation Committee, um, I believe the City Hall uh, had a work session on public safety and during that, uh, perhaps it was Commissioner Hardesty mentioned that they were seeking to bring in outside experts to help with that. Have you all heard anything about that? Yes, we're, um, well, I don't know what she's speaking of specifically, but we are meeting with some um, outside people, some people from PSU to consult with us as to our next steps. Okay, uh, if y'all can kind of make that public, that would be appreciated in emails or otherwise as to when these meetings are taking place, thanks. Okay, thank you. And uh, the youth subcommittee. Sure. Thanks, Haji. Um, so we met sometime last week for sort of a work group meeting, myself, Taji, and Alana, uh, and set a few things in motion. First of all, we reached out to and received confirmation from Sergeant Schmatz of uh, Strategic Services, I, I believe, and he'll be coming uh, at our next meeting in March uh, to talk about updates with PDB's youth work, as well as an update on whether there'll be any youth-specific training um, for the next uh, training term. So that was one thing that we worked on. Uh, and we'll have an update about what comes from that meeting at the next general body meeting. Uh, then we also worked on a youth directive, a, a youth directive recommendation that uh, if, if at all possible, we'll present or submit for the next full body meeting, but potentially uh, the one in April. Um, and this is sort of a follow up to a previous recommendation we made in the fall. Um, but really, uh, it's also in response to and it's sort of in a similar vein to the recent uh, recommendation on, on interacting with individuals in the LGBTQ plus community. Uh, this one instead will be how police officers, um, both in policy, but also uh, like actually, you know, out in the field, if you will, how they can better interact with young people. Um, so it's, it's more of a coordination effort um, to, uh, to, to review the policy and to add on to that. Um, so, so they're working on that and, and we'll just be doing some more work on that in the next month and then again present on it at the next full body meeting. Anything you want to add, Todd? We'll be meeting on March 8th is the meeting where we'll have uh, Sergeant Schmatz and we'll be discussing the recommendation with uh, Mary Claire and the policy team from PDB as well. So excited to have that conversation. If you're interested, uh, March 8th at 
5 p.m. I believe. I think that's right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Britt. Um, next up, the racial equity subcommittee. I don't know if Marcia or Lakiana are here. Are they here? They're not here. Okay. I did I, get to that meeting, um, but maybe they'll they can do a, um, a, some words about it later when they when they get here. Yeah, I know I accepted Marcia into the room, so maybe she's having some internet problems or something. Doesn't seem like she. No, Marcia did. texted me. She couldn't make it, unfortunately. Oh, okay. She was having too much technical difficulty. Got it. Um, the, her computer was like off. So, okay, we'll hopefully hear back from Racial Equity Subcommittee. I know they had a listening session with the Latinx community. And so hopefully we'll hear from them uh, either via email or they come in later tonight. Um, awesome. So then the Settlement Agreement Policy Subcommittee. Hi, everybody. We uh, met and had a discussion on two main issues. Uh, the PS3 Public Safety Support Specialist uh, recommendation that is um, available for discussion today as well. And we had um, Lieutenant Greg Stewart there who is um, uh, the, involved in the PS3 program from the training division, um, kind of talk us through some of the finer points and answer any questions that were raised. Um, and we also discussed, uh, thanks to Anne, um, the directives that I think are also on the agenda today and had some uh, community feedback on those directives. Um, Anne, would you like to talk about that at all? Yes, um, we actually ran out of time and weren't able to discuss them, uh, the directives. So they are, we are going to be discussing them today at our meeting. Thank you. Another point of clarification I forgot to mention earlier is that the on the agenda, you might see a TAC update at the bottom that's lumped into the SAP recommendation. It didn't need to be separate off of things there. Um, and then from there, the behavioral health subcommittee. Yeah, hi Taji and everyone. Um, we had a great meeting um, this month. We're doing work around and what does that look like and how we can um, incorporate it into our community better. So that will be our further work. We're going to dedicate the next couple months towards more, you know, in-depth conversations. So uh, please attend first Tuesday every month. Thank you. I just want to add to Amy's uh, ex, um, explanation that we also had at least five um, police bureau members there. So I just want to make sure that folks know that uh, they were present and Amy's just asking for additional folks and for the folks to keep coming. Thank you. Thank you. And I did just get a uh, notice from Marcy about just what the racial equity subcommittee has been up to, um, that they'll just be working with the assistant chief of police uh, on working to get more feedback. And um, they also gave some feedback on PJ recommendations. I'm assuming that's, oh, procedural justice. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> so that's their updates. Uh, and thank you, Londa and Amy. Cool. And I think the last one was PPB updates. Hi everybody, Chris Davis here from the Police Bureau. Uh, I don't have a whole lot. Obviously, there's always a lot going on in the Police Bureau. Uh, we continue to focus a lot of energy on a really unprecedented rise in gun violence in the city. Um, and as you probably saw last week, we announced the rollout of um, really just us being able to replace of the capability that we lost last year to have people on call specifically tasked to come out and conduct crime scene investigations at uh, shooting scenes and scenes and scenes where shots are fired where there's a need for you know some enhanced forensic evidence gathering capabilities you know if you have 50 or 60 rounds fired into a house or something like that, then it, that really benefits from uh, a more consistent and, and a little more detailed investigative processing than, than we were able to get it when we were just doing that with patrol resources. So we continue to work with the mayor's office and a large group of other stakeholders on our part of the city's larger 
strategy that is emerging to address gun violence in the community. Um, we are also in budget season. We have our budget presentation at the, at the city council budget work group coming up uh, later this month. And we're, we're working on that with the, the city budget office and the mayor's office. Um, and then, you know, of course, lots of other things going on. I'm happy to, I, I wanna be respectful of people's time, but I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone has when the time comes. Actually, I do have a question. Um, I was interested to hear you talk about the new gun violence group as a replacement. And I was wondering of previous uh, groups, and I was wondering how this new group might differ from the GVRT or not. No, it's, they're really very different things. This focuses on the investigative piece of gun violence. So after the incident has already happened, uh, GVRT was a different thing. That was a, more of a uniform patrol function. This is not that. This is just to augment our investigative capability for, for shooting scenes. So this is after the crime has happened versus you know the GVRT approach was a prevention approach where officers went out proactively um, they made a lot of relationships with people uh, in, in the community, particularly um, in places where we experienced a lot of gun violence, but their focus was to try to interdict that before it happened. So what this does is it, it gives us back some, you know, we also part of the, the tactical operations division back there was this shooting investigative function. Um, which it, we moved to our detective division from tactical operations and in, in the, the kind of reorganization that we made in light of this year's budget. Um, but this really is just on call capacity for people who are already working in the detective division on investigating gun crimes. So that instead of having patrol officers be responsible for processing these scenes where a lot of shots are fired and no one is hit, but there's still a lot of investigative value because you see a lot of the same guns, you see a lot of the same people involved in multiple incidents. And so you may collect some evidence at the scene of one of these shootings where no one is hit that helps you solve a homicide or an injury shooting that happens somewhere else. So this is really aimed at, at that more than the proactive uh, sort of patrol-based prevention mission. Thanks. Um, and just one more question. Um, so today they announced the settlement of the um, with the Quanis Hayes family for the wrongful death shooting. Um, when something like that happens, is there what is what does the police bureau do to learn from a uh, uh, mistake that has cost the city $2 million has lost the life of a member of the community. In other words, what kind of learning happens as a result of, of this uh, incident? Well, first of all, there's an assumption implicit in the question that, that the city is somehow admitting that a mistake was made by settling a case that, that is not necessarily the case. I'll leave that to the city attorney's office to explain how that works. But we don't wait for a lawsuit to learn from these events. We analyze every deadly force event very carefully. There's a huge investigation that happens both uh, by detectives for the criminal component and then later on an administrative investigation that happens that also includes a training review of every one of those incidents. And there doesn't have to be even an allegation of wrongdoing or anything like that before we'll, we'll embark on that training review. It's a matter of policy for every deadly force incident. And we'll take that training review and, and it, part of that is to look at anywhere that there are gaps in our training, things that we can learn from incidents, even where everything you know, went as, as well as it could in sometimes really difficult situations, there's always something that you can learn and that you can take back 
to identify where you have training needs, if there are policy gaps that need to be filled up. But that's not, again, it doesn't take a lawsuit to get us to do that. We do that in every one of these cases as a matter of policy. Thank you. And thank you, um, PDD, perfect. Uh, and I am, oh, Amy, go ahead. Yeah, my question real quick, quick to Chris is, is there a mental health assessment done on the officer after the shooting to determine um, whether or not there might be uh, further trauma triggers in their um, history? Yeah, thanks, Amy. I appreciate that question because yes, we do require officers who are involved in critical incidents to have a visit with a mental health professional before they come back to duty. And then there are a number of follow-up visits that they have down the road because sometimes uh, you know, P PTSD can manifest itself some some time after the event and so we we have uh, follow-up visits even once an officer has returned to service but before we'll return them to service we do require them to sit down with a mental health professional thank you and uh caitlin and benjamin hey um I just had also had a question. Um, you said that gun violence is on the rise. I'm just kind of curious as to where one could find sort of statistics on that. And if you could give an example of some of the, I don't know, some of the recent gun violence has been going down around the city. I'm, I'm kind of curious. I haven't seen much in the news, so they must be keeping it quiet. Yeah, I can't speak to the level of media coverage, but I can give you some numbers of where we are right now. I just got an update this afternoon, as a matter of fact. Um, so as of right now, in 2021, we have had 151 reported incidents in the city where shots were fired. In 41 of those cases, we had people who sustained non-fatal injuries who were struck by gunfire and then we have had eight homicides um, by gunfire. We've had more homicides than that total this year. That is significantly above where we are normally at this time of year. Um, we have an, a, a pretty robust open data portal on our website. And what I can do is uh, I can try to find that and maybe put a link in the chat. But if you go on our on the Police Bureau webpage and look for our open data portal, there is a wealth of information for you about all kinds of crime data. Hey, Marcus. Great, thank you. Okay, and and uh, thank you, Caitlin and Benjamin, and thank you, PPD. For time's sake, we have to uh, move on from here. Um, I'm gonna now uh, position it over to Elliot to take it from here and introduce uh, Tom and Dr. Rosenbaum. Yes, so I put in the chat the open data um, site that Chris was referring to. So the, our main um, main act tonight, that was just the warm up session, is our friends from Kokel, Dennis Rosenbaum and Tom Kristoff, and they have uh, their fourth quarter draft report, which hopefully you all have um, been reading over this last few weeks. Um, I think they said they could do this in about 30, 40 minutes, their presentation part, and then we will have ample time for community discussion and questions um, back to them. So I, I believe Dennis and Tom, you are co-hosts, so you can just share your screens and get to it. Thank you for coming. Thanks, Elliot. Hi, I'm Dennis Rosenbaum, uh, pronounce he, him. Um, and Tom, as the PowerPoint here coming up. Um, we, uh, let's see, hold on a sec. I've got a, so, so you know, I want to thank, first of all, uh, the PSEP for giving us this opportunity again to present to you and, and uh, our findings, and also thank everyone that's uh, participating tonight. Um, 
uh, as the compliance officer, we've been working on this for a while. And Tom uh, Kristoff, my colleague, Dr. Kristoff, and I will give a brief summary of the fourth quarter of 2020. Uh, uh, we'll try to limit it as much as we can so we can open it up for <clears throat> questions and comments. Um, the, uh, Tom, if you want to go to the next slide there, um, we, uh, these are the, the questions that remain the same pretty much uh, uh, each quarter here. You know, has, P, has the city and PPB sustained the systems needed for reform during this maintenance year? So recall that they achieved full compliance January 10th of 2020, which has been over a year now, but they needed to remain in compliance for one full year. Uh, and so the other question, have they continued the data collection and analysis to identify problems and trends and provide feedback to the community? And have they continued to conduct self-evaluations and make adjustments as needed when there are problems that, that emerge? So let's go on to the next slide and just, I wanna summarize briefly for you what we did conclude in the fourth quarter report here, and then we'll go into it in more detail. Uh, the city has remained in substantial compliance for the following areas of the settlement agreement, community-based mental health services, crisis intervention, and the employee information system. They fell out of compliance in training during the third quarter of 2020, uh, but returned to substantial compliance in the fourth quarter. We'll come back to that. Um, they fell out of compliance in use of force during the third quarter, but were unable to return to substantial compliance in the fourth quarter. And then in the fourth quarter, uh, PPB fell out of substantial compliance for officer accountability and community engagement. Now the community engagement finding is new. It's not in the draft that we posted. So I'll talk to you a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, so this evening, Tom and I will say a few words about each area where they've maintained compliance and give most of our attention though to areas where substantial compliance was uh, not maintained during the 2020 maintenance year. So one more quick comment before I start here, Tom, on the next slide about factors uh, that interfere. You know, in 2020, everybody knows it's a very difficult year uh, for everyone, the pandemic, the protests, and, uh, Oregon also had fires and financial problems in the city, and now the increased gun violence. Certainly these factors seem to have interfered with the city and PPB's ability to maintain compliance. And oftentimes I face the question of, well, why didn't you take these factors into consideration when evaluating compliance? And, you know, because the city and PPB face what some call impossible circumstances. Well, we did mention these constraining factors uh, in our third and fourth quarter reports, and we did so at length. Um, but I wanna stress again that, you know, Kokel's job is to call balls and strikes. And you know, to take this baseball analogy a step further, you know, if the if the batter's hit by a bicyclist walking to the baseball park and is in pain and the injury to the batter, it may have an impact, but it shouldn't affect the umpire's calls of balls and strikes. And certainly, uh, you know, we can talk much more about this, but uh, there is still a chance. There is there's there's many opportunities to correct this. So in a nutshell, our primary job is to evaluate compliance with the terms of the settlement agreement. Uh, and the responsibility is really with others to address the conditions that underlie that performance. I think the Department of Justice has taken a similar approach, but I'll let them speak for themselves and hopefully uh, they'll be available to answer your questions at some point in the near future. Um, and it, some of you may have noticed that DOJ's report was also released recently after our report. and so. Hopefully you'll have a chance to read that and uh, see, uh, we can talk uh, later if you'd like about the comparison between the two. So let's get started and have uh, Dr. Christoph present. Tom, do you wanna go ahead and start on use of force? Yes, sir. Thank you, Dr. Rosenbaum. Um, so in, in section three, use of force, uh, you know, we, we focused on the areas where we had still found compliance um, and then focused on the areas where we had, felt, where we had felt that uh, PVB had fallen out of compliance. Um, so one of the things that we, we've consistently done is looked at the, the quarterly analysis of force. Um, what we've seen is that the raw numbers of force have been consistent with prior trends, that there's been decreases in the raw numbers of force, um, but that this decrease is due to uh, the, the force to custody rate has increased, um, but that's because of a decrease in the interactions and arrests. Um, 
we've also found maintained compliance with the supervisor's checklist, which is the after action report. And we'll, we'll get into a little bit about our concern with some of the protest force after action reports. Um, but the supervisor's checklist remains. Um, the patrol supervision levels, these have maintained uh, compliance. Uh, in terms of areas that we had found had returned to compliance, uh, prior, we did not have sufficient documentation to assess whether the criteria for CEWs were being maintained, um, as well as the force audit uh, PPB had momentarily paused counting uh, the uses of force that happened in the protests. Um, and so in our quarter three report, we had found them out of compliance with these paragraphs. Uh, for this report, we, we found that they had returned to compliance. Um, we also want to, you know, kind of note here that the failure to maintain compliance, which I'll get into in a second, uh, it's related to protest force. We every quarter we look at, you know, randomly chosen non-protest force cases, and for this quarter, the, those randomly chosen uh, non-protest force cases, they did show comprehensive documentation. Uh, comprehensive review by the by the uh, supervisors. So for all of the places where we find people or find PPB to be out of uh, substantial compliance, it's much more related to the protest force than it is uh, the non-protest force. Uh, paragraphs that we did find uh, PPB uh, had not maintained substantial compliance. Uh, paragraph 66, 67, and 69. Um, these deal with FDCRs. Uh, overall, we had found insufficient detail within the force reports to assess the use of force incident. Uh, we had found uh, FDCRs, which used the actions of the crowd to justify the use of force rather than the actions of the force recipient. Um, we found that there was a, a lack of de-escalation consistently demonstrated. Um, we found inconsistent descriptions of active aggression, um, and we had found that FDCRs were completed in a timely manner, but other relevant documents were not, and this ultimately impacted the after-action review for sergeants. Um, for paragraph 70 um, and 73, these are dealing with after action reports. Uh, what we had found were that the AARs were not uniformly completed in a timely manner. Um, some were even completed in later months. Uh, we, one of the quotes that we had put into our report was from a supervisor saying the 72 hour requirement is simply unreasonable when there are large scale riots involving multiple officers using multiple types of force at multiple locations over 90 nights in a row. And I think this goes back to something that Dr. Rosenbaum had said was, it, it may be reasonable that the 72 hour requirement was not, uh, was simply unreasonable. Um, but as Dr. Rosenbaum said, our, our job is to more call balls and strikes. Um, we, we found the supervisor review to be inconsistent. There was inconsistent review of videos. Uh, there were inconsistent interviews of officers who had used force. And there was inconsistent referral to IA on uses of force that, that, appeared, to, that appeared that the officer had violated policy. Um, Overall, simply the, the system became overwhelmed. Um, and this is something that we, we talk a lot, uh, both in our quarter three report and in our quarter four report. Um, and so some of the quotes that we had seen in the after action reviews really spoke to this uh, overwhelming. So one of the things, although sergeants have been assigned to review these uh, the force events, they're not being properly conducted for ongoing protests. Interviews with officers are not being conducted. Videos are not being submitted or reviewed. And then one of the other uh, supervisors uh, wrote that the frequency of the incidents combined with the lack of downtime between events has overwhelmed the system designed to capture information and investigate force at every level of review. And so these, these two quotes were kind of emblematic of some of the things that we had been seeing when we were reviewing the after actions um, and the FDCRs. So overall, we looked at the use of force management um, and we felt that there were some things that uh, PPB could be doing. So one of the things we, we had seen steps taken by PPB uh, during the, you know, in our third quarter report, we reported on those, um, 
you know, in great depth, here's all the things that they had done, but these were done on an emergency basis um, without a broader implementation plan. So what, we've, what we asked PPB in this report to do was uh, to do consistent evaluations. There weren't consistent evaluations. Um, there weren't intermittent after action reviews of the broader event. There were after action reviews of a particular force event, but not intermittent after action reviews of the broader event. So a broader evaluation is currently being done now, <coughs> excuse me, um, but it, it's being done after the fact. Um, what we would expect is that this broader evaluation, the lessons learned from it, then to be turned into revised policies, revised SOPs and revised training so that in the future, if PPB undergoes a similar event um, or a similar string of events, uh, that they'll be They'll, they'll be prepared for it and won't fall into the same issues as, as they did this last summer. And I'll hand it back to Dr. Rosenbaum uh, to speak about the training. Okay, thanks, Tom. Uh, section four is about training. Um, as we described in our report, uh, PPB's training was weakened by the COVID-19 pandemic and the protests and racial injustice and some administrative decisions within the Bureau and the city. And these factors resulted in changes uh, to their training schedule, their methods of delivery and their evaluation metrics. Um, however, we, we documented that earlier and most of these training systems have continued to function and meet the minimum standards of the settlement agreement. So let me, here's the evaluation standards we've used. We look at training needs assessment, they've remained in compliance there. They completed their needs assessment and their training plan in the fourth quarter. Evaluation systems, they remained in compliance. They've strengthened their evaluation system for online training, which was a bit problematic at first. Uh, their analysis and reporting of force data, they've remained in compliance with quarterly reports and presentations by the force inspector uh, to the training advisory council. I think the latest one was November 11th. And uh, documenting and reporting training, they've remained in compliance using their learning management system, LMS, to complete these tasks. Now, the high quality training, uh, they returned, here's where they fell out of compliance in the third quarter. Uh, and I'll explain that in just a sec, uh, but they returned to substantial compliance in our rating in the fourth quarter. So Tom, if we can go to the next slide on the problems that occurred in the third quarter. Um, you know, again, due to the pandemic and all of that, uh, more than half of the uh, PPB members did not receive their skills refresher training, and that included use of force and de-escalation, procedural justice, et cetera. Um, they put together a remediation plan, but it, uh, the plan to correct the problem and make up these classes we felt was inadequate by our standards and, and lacked the detail that we felt was needed. And um, the needs assessment and training plan had yet to be finalized, but they weren't due yet really until the end of the year, but that couldn't help us make sense of any future training plans. And the evaluation systems were weakened by, you know, moving from the classroom to online training, uh, the usual in-class surveys, for example, were missing. Uh, so that was the problem in the third quarter. So Tom, if we can go to the next slide. Um, and things improved pretty dramatically in the fourth quarter. Um, they prepared a very detailed training plan and lesson plans for all the classes. Um, the training plan included very clear remedies to address the training deficiencies that we had pointed out in the previous quarter and specifically the skills classes that were missing. And, and the training methods and the platforms for all the classes were carefully defined. So we knew which classes would be delivered in person and those that would be delivered online and some that would be a combination. And we could see that the adult learning principles were being followed. Um, it clearly, uh, all of you know uh, that the transition to virtual education and training is something our entire country is struggling with from elementary school to the workplace. And there's many challenges with that. And, but PPB made a really strong effort to make that transition using some new IT tools and, and properly trained staff to get the job done there. And, uh, and we reviewed and approved the lesson plans for in service for, the, for this year. And the needs assessment fi was finalized. So they're able to complete its training plan for 2021. Um, they now have the evaluation methods and metrics in place for both online and in-person formats. So officers, 
class content, instructors, they can all be quickly evaluated and adjustments made. Uh, just a quick footnote, you know, the staffing for virtual training has improved slightly. They've hired one uh, person, a graphic designer, a videographer, but, you know, PPV may need more training staff in the future to make a real full transition to virtual platforms and to enhance the scenario training on communication skills. I don't know if that means there may be a staffing analysis of some sort in the future, you know, in light of all the budget constraints and cuts. So we, we see training as a reform priority and something that has to be given the support it needs. So in a nutshell, you know, COCO satisfied with the training remedies that the PPB has introduced and therefore we've reinstated the rating of substantial compliance for section four of the settlement agreement. Um, however, I'll point out that DOJ's recent report does not grant substantial compliance because the remedial makeup training was not implemented in 2020. And our position is slightly different. Uh, beginning in January, uh, PPB is currently reintroducing nearly the identical training skills that we observed and approved uh, in 2020 prior to COVID-19. So we didn't feel a need to uh, obligate to observe it again prior to our rating, but I certainly understand both positions in this case. Okay, Tom, I think it's back to you. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so I'll go into section five, um, which is community-based mental health services. Uh, we continue to find that C the city and PVB play an active role um, in community-based mental health service, um, both uh, through the Behavioral Health Unit Advisory Committee, the BHUAC, uh, the Behavioral Health Coordination Team. Uh, PVB serves on the Unity Transportation Workgroup, um, the Oregon Behavioral Health Collaborative, and the Legacy ED Community Outreach Group. Um, we also continue to find that the Unity Center operates in accordance with the Memphis model of crisis response um, and that the Unity Center uh, mitigates potential for criminalization and reduces resource burden on the PPB. And I, I know that there's always a concern with the Unity Center, but as it relates to the settlement agreement, we continue to find that uh, the city has substantially complied with this section. Um, for crisis intervention, uh, section six, uh, we, we continue to find that the policies have remained in effect uh, for BOEC, that they provide training. Uh, COVID has impacted the ability of BOEC to provide in-service training, but they've come up with some alternate training approaches that we feel are acceptable given the situation. Um, PPB does continue to provide all officers with 40 hours of uh, CIT courses uh, prior to graduating the Advanced Academy. Um, they maintain their specialized model in the ECIT program. Uh, and, and we find that the BHRT and the SCT have been maintained. However, we do note that the BHRT has lost uh, one of their uh, response teams um, and that this response team came from uh, the self-learning of PPB that, that the uh, homeless outreach and uh, the follow-up teams that they created based on data analysis. They've lost one of those teams. Um, and so we, we really hope that they can re-up those teams in some way in the future. Uh, with crisis intervention as well, the Behavioral Health Unit Advisory Committee continues to meet. Uh, they've, they've discussed their bylaws, PPB SOPs, their makeup um, and national local events and also participate on the coalition of PPB advisory councils, as well as participating in the behavioral health subcommittee meetings of the PSAP. Uh, looking at the employee information system, uh, EIS continues to upload data nightly, which creates uh, automatic alerts related to force, traumatic incidents, complaints, and commendations. Uh, that when an alert is created, they continue to be reviewed by EIS administrators and forwarded on to the RU manager. Uh, for alerts that were sent to supervisors to evaluate, 77% 77.7% of those resulted in an intervention with the officer. Uh, additionally, we've seen that there, there's a requirement to review an employee's EIS. Uh, their, their jacket uh, for annually, as well as when they uh, are switched to a new to command review. Um, and we've seen increased compliance with these as well. 
I'll move into accountability because this is also one of the areas that uh, PPB and the city have fallen out of substantial compliance. We had noted in our last report that there was a large increase in the number of contacts as well as the number of complaints being submitted uh, in June as well as in, in July. Um, so for instance, in June, IPR had reached, uh, had received 227 contacts. In October, that number was 26. Uh, in June, 82 administrative investigations were opened. In October, that number was 19. So we're seeing, we're seeing the, the numbers returning to normal levels. Um, as well as we're seeing uh, improvement in expediency for most stages of an administrative investigation uh, where we, we had seen in, for instance, in July, IPR had completed their stages on time 64.8% of the time. Now they've returned to being consistent with uh, IA at around 94%. Um, where we're seeing uh, uh, IPR continue to, to be below the, the expected rate of when they're uh, getting stuff done on time is with intake investigation. So that's the second chart over here, um, where even in November, there are approximately 60% of the intake investigations were being conducted in the amount of time that, that were allotted. Uh, this has impacted their ability to comply with the 180 day um, timeline as required by paragraph 121. Uh, so if you see in this uh, table over here, if you look at IPR over the last four or five uh, quarters, they've been at 60%, 50%, 60%, 50%. Um, so they, they have not maintained that substantial compliance with, with conducting full administrative investigations in a timely manner. There's a couple of reasons for this. Um, there's some resource concerns with IPR. Uh, they are not at their full staff right now. And there's the potential for more resignations based on the um, based on the new accountability uh, system that's being developed. Um, we've offered some solutions in our uh, in our report. One is using temporary or third party investigators to be able to bring them back into compliance. Um, and as well as you know, similar to the use of force uh, that we set of PPB is learning from, learning from the protests, revising the policies and SOPs and training so the systems don't become overwhelmed as they were when, when the summer protests were occurring. Uh, other sections of accountability, we've, we've seen maintained compliance. Um, transparency, there remains online tracking of cases. CRC remains open to the public. Then PRB summaries are still provided. Uh, there's still mirrored policies with joint training and a discipline guide to ensure consistency. And the systems of checks and balances still remains between IPR reviewing, RU manager findings, the CRC and PRB. Uh, finally, in the accountability, uh, there's requirements of PPB when there's an OIS event. There was one OIS in the fourth quarter. In that instance, we, we reviewed documentation that witnesses and involved officers were separated. There was walkthroughs and interviews of witnesses. CROs were issued. Uh, we did not see the 48-hour interview with the involved officer, but that's because the officer was incapacitated at the time. Um, I believe that, that that interview has occurred since. Um, and finally, as, as, we, as I you know, kind of said before, the ballot measure, the, the new accountability system is still being developed. We, we have not seen a, a final proposal. Um, and all that we, all that we do as, as calling balls and strikes is we, we need to make sure that that final construction of the proposed board is in line with the settlement agreement. Um, <coughs> excuse me, based on paragraph four. And I will pass it back to Dr. Rosenbaum now. Thanks, Tom. Um, okay, uh, you know, regarding uh, section nine, community engagement and PSEP's role, well, you folks know more about this than I do, uh, but our findings clearly uh, regarding PSEP don't, do not change between the third and fourth quarter. We're very pleased with the, the work you folks have been doing. I list here some things you've continued to meet regularly and support multiple subcommittees uh, using the virtual platform. Uh, You've continued to solicit 
input from community members and community organizations and the government and the COCO even on a range of topics. I see, for example, your subcommittees in behavioral health and racial equity have jointly hosted a community forum regarding behavioral health and BIPOC communities um, and uh, PPB's use of force. Uh, in addition, you co-hosted town halls with us to review our findings and similar to what we're doing this evening. And you've got a bunch of other projects uh, you're working on now that I've noticed. So one of the more significant events, in my opinion, in our opinion, is that the mayor accepted PSEP's recommendation to create a Truth and Reconciliation Commission and directed you to uh, form a subcommittee charged with planning its development. Uh, we look forward to you know, your progress on this and uh, your first meeting in January, which we observed was a very good start in laying out the scope and responsibilities. Um, now, PSEP has maintained a working relationship with PPB and, for example, reviewing their directives and the community engagement plan and uh, PPB's annual report, uh, among other things. And the city continues to support PSEP by ensuring adequate membership and training and staffing and technical assistance, as we see tonight. Um, uh, PPB and the city officials have consistently attended PSEP meetings to answer any questions that may arise. So in summary, you know, we find that the city uh, via PSEP has remained in substantial compliance with the settlement agreement paragraphs pertaining to PSEP. But let's go to the next slide, Tom, that they turning to the PSEP, uh, the role of uh, PPB. Uh, during the fourth quarter, they've continued to implement the four components of the community engagement plan. Uh, that's public involvement, communication, access, and training. And you can see our report for details. Uh, they've continued to work with it, their advisory councils, uh, and this includes the coalition of advisory groups, the collection of all of them, as well as PSEP and, and TAC, the Training Advisory Committee. And they've prepared quarterly and annual reports on traffic stops and use of force with breakdowns by race and gender, all of which are required here. But you know, a quick note on the traffic stop since we're into data. Um, the 2019 data did not indicate really any serious racial bias in stops. In other words, you know, all the racial ethnic groups were stopped at similar rates when you use certain benchmarks as a control. But it does continue to show disparities in searches conducted after the stop has been made. Now, specifically, Black African Americans were asked to consent to a search nearly twice as often as all other racial ethnic groups. So um, I really do think that the, the new template that PPB has put into place for reporting, which now requires officers to document the reasons for stops and the reasons for searches, uh, should be helpful down the road, both in documenting the problem and in changing behavior. I mean, my own experience tells me that when you measure something, the behavior tends to change. So. Um, in the draft you received, we reported that PPB had maintained substantial compliance in section four on community engagement. However, we have revised that assessment because of some issues with paragraph 151. Um, if we can just go, Tom, you've gone to that, okay. Um, this paragraph states that PPB must issue an annual report, must share it, a draft with PC, PSEP, present a revised report with city, to city council and, and, and all three precincts and the community presentation should cover certain content. Um, some piece of comments uh, recommendations were incorporated, as you know, and some were uh, deflected until next year. Uh, we've asked PPB to provide more clarity around the PCEP's role in reviewing the annual report. We've also encouraged them to provide a, a broader definition of the public precinct meetings, excuse me, broader notification of those meetings. Um, because you know, this is a community engagement opportunity, frankly, to be transparent and build some trust. Uh, by the end of the fourth quarter, PPB had presented at two precincts, uh, and they also presented to the city council, I should say, but at the two precincts, north and central, and but not in the eastern precinct because there were staffing issues related to COVID. Um, because PPB had completed the other requirements of paragraph 150, and we expected the third and final meeting to occur within a few days, uh, we decided to give the city substantial compliance on 150. However, we've since learned that the East Precinct virtual meeting did not occur and the content of the meetings, uh, all the meetings could not be independently verified. So we're 
Well, and we were not invited to these precinct meetings and, and did not know how they uh, know that they had occurred until after the fact. So as a result of the missed meetings, the missed meeting and East Precinct and the uncertain content of the meetings, we've decided to change our assessment from full compliance to partial compliance for paragraph 150. And that's it for our presentation. So we'll open it up for comments. I do want to say before we start that uh, we've extended the deadline for you to give us feedback to March 1st at 5 p.m. And you can email to this site if you don't get a chance to uh, make your comments or suggestions uh, tonight. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dennis and Tom. And maybe you could yeah, stop sharing. Um, so we will open it up. I, I just had one question to start off. Um, which is about transparency and building trust. As we see from your report, the vast majority of use of force incidents occurred in crowd control. The crowd control use of force is not reported on the open data portal. I was um, participated in the National Association for Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement, one of their webinars, and was able to speak with the pe people who do civilian oversight in Washington, DC, and in New Orleans. And Washington, DC has lots of public protests, as we know. Um, they told me that it is a regular practice that they report all use of force incidents together. And they were frankly, surprised and a little shocked that Portland did not. Um, and so I wanted to ask you as um, people who are interested in transparency and public communication, whether you think it would be a good idea for the PBB to include crowd control use of force incidents in their public um, open data portal. So Elliot, I can, I can respond. I, I do want to, respond real quick because we were going through the presentations I couldn't see the comments um, and I know a lot of people were talking about um, acronyms yes the acronyms are included in our report and I apologize for for using so many of them we wanted to make sure that we left enough time open uh, for for discussion so I, I did use acronyms and I know Dr. Rosenbaum used acronyms and so I apologize if there's anything that's uh, confusing uh, just please let us know and I can you know, I can expand. Uh, Elliot, to, to your point, uh, in the PBB's quarterly reports, they do report on the protest uses of force. They're in a different section um, because they feel it's, it's difficult to, to compare protest force with non-protest force. Um, I think that it's understandable, their position, but they, it's not that they don't report them. Um, they, they are reported. Our report looks at the non-protest force um, just kind of as a, as a consistent way to look at it across the board. Um, but PPB does include the protest force as part of their quarterly reports. No, I understand that. But the question is when you go to the open data portal, which um, the officer referred the public to, th they are not included in that data. And so someone looking at that would look at trend lines and would look at number of incidents and would get a, a mistaken impression about use of force. And given that it, this national body said it was best practices around the country to include <clears throat> this in the same thing, it seems that Portland is an outlier. Um, I know that you're not, you, you're not answering for the PPB. So um, I just um, wanted to raise that point that it seems uh, because you are, people who do work at a national scale to see this as an anomaly and um, not as a best practice. I, I can assure you that we have raised this issue in meetings and it's been a source of disagreement about this. And uh, the argument to some extent was the need to have a system in place for auditing force and looking at it as a group cluster of events. and. But uh, you know, we uh, we feel that there 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 are opportunities here to combine these. Okay, thank you, um, Anne. I see your hand up. Thank you. I just had a question at the beginning of your presentation. You talked about um, that PPB momentarily paused 
uh, after action reports. I believe that was the month of June. Um, and I'm wondering, did they ever catch up with that? Were those ever, what happened to that? No, I don't, I don't believe we had said that they had paused after action reports. Uh, what they had done was pause the counting of force reports. So it, it goes to as part of their audit. So that 73, 74, 75, and 77 um, in terms of uh, counting the, the number of protest force and being able to provide that number. After action reports conducted by supervisors, they still continued. Um, again, I, I, I think we had said in our, our presentation and our report that we have a little bit of concern with how the after action reviews were conducted. Um, but they they did continue. I don't, they they never paused doing the after action reports. What was the pause then? The pause was the force audit um, and counting uh, the force uh, occurrences from protest events. And did they ever catch up? Yes. Uh, so we had found in this report we had brought 74, 75, and 77 back into substantial compliance because they resumed, uh, particularly with the uh, force inspector reviewing those incidents to identify personnel trends, to identify training trends, things of that nature. They will have a force, uh, a protest force audit report that I, I don't know exactly when it comes out, but they do it on an annual basis um, and that will be coming out, but that's what they had paused, not doing the after action reports. Thank you. You're welcome. So please, if you're either a PSEP member or a member of the community, um, you could raise your hand in the um, using the raise hand function or simply raise your hand or put it in the um, chat if you have a question about the COCAL report or a comment. Um, Portland Cop Watch, yes. Hi, this is Dan Handelman with Portland Cop Watch and we're preparing our analysis uh, we're combining our analysis of the COCL report and the DOJ report, and uh, I'm very thankful that you agreed that the um, Bureau is out of policy in their presentations of the their annual report. I think I would go further than what either you or the DOJ are saying, though, but that the, the invitations, I saw a, a copy of an email invitation to one of the precinct um, presentations, and it only went to about seven or eight people. It did not seem to be a go, go out widely at all. I'm, I'm very surprised they didn't invite the compliance officer. Um, we heard, obviously didn't hear anything about it here at Portland Cop Watch. We didn't go to those meetings. You said they weren't recorded either, and that's why you can't prove what was said at them. There are specific things that are supposed to be done at those presentations around bias-based policing and use of force that aren't really in the annual report at all, and they weren't discussed at the city council meeting. So they're much further out of compliance than what you're indicating. Uh, and more, moreover, the city council meeting should be a public meeting like this with public feedback. And because the mayor completely com continues to refuse to uh, accept public comment on reports, uh, which we talked about at the last meeting, um, there was no public comment that day. Uh, the entire presentation lasted less than 15 minutes. Um, so it, was, it really did not meet the, the spirit of the agreement in any way, shape, or form. Uh, and I don't want to, you know, Focus only on that portion, but I'm saying I, I wanted to thank you for changing your minds on that. Uh, that being said, you're um, calling yourselves umpires who call balls and strikes leads to the question of why do you know, why do you think that the training division is back in compliance when the game's not over? They're in the seventh inning and one team is winning, but they haven't actually finished the game yet. They haven't give, delivered the training, as the DOJ said. So I really think you should revise um, that finding as well. Uh, you cannot, you know, pre precognitively say well, because they promised they're going to do this that they are in compliance. If that were the case, we wouldn't even have to have a compliance officer. We wouldn't have to have an agreement. But the city is completely, you know, it's always promising to do things and then falling down. Uh, so I think that's a really important point. Uh, you talked about the force to custody ratio, uh, and that the reason that it's going up is that there have been fewer encounters with community members, but that doesn't excuse the fact what your report says that the custodies themselves are down by 25%, but force is only down by 16%. So in other words, proportionally speaking, they're using more force, and that's why the force to custody ratio is going up. So that should be concerning to you. 
since the entire point of having this agreement is to reduce how much force there is, and they're going in the wrong direction. Um, I, you know, I, <laughs> I always have a lot more to say, but um, I, I want to kind of respect everybody else's time. I think I've taken up three minutes already. If there's more time later, I'd like to say more. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. So, Tom, Dennis, you want to respond to that? Yeah, let me, I'll just start real quickly. Thank you, Dan. Uh, thank you for acknowledging us in, in one place there. And uh, I do think that, I think uh, PPB can easily uh, clean up that invitation issue. And it is a, an easy opportunity with these precinct meetings to talk about bias and talk about the things that are listed in paragraph 150. And we'll make sure that that's covered in our draft revision. Um, the issue of the training, I hear what you're saying and DOJ, here's what you're saying. Uh, if it were new training that was completely different, I absolutely would have insisted on seeing it. I know that they can deliver this training. They did it before. I was there in February of 2020. They just missed half the people. So I, I did give them the benefit of the doubt. It's a, you know, you, I can understand your position. You know, you can go either way on that. Uh, new training that they're doing, and there is some, we will be watching that this, this quarter and making sure that that's executed well, as we have always done in the past. Tom, did you want to add something? Uh, yeah, Dan, to your, to your point about uh, the reduction of contacts um, and enforce, I think one of the things that we have to look at is the type of contacts that are occurring. Um, and that's something that I, I, I think that we can look into a little bit further uh, and get back to you. But if, if the notion is that the PPB is reducing, you know, kind of the over enforcement uh, context, I, I think that that may explain why one may fall at a greater rate than the other. But it's, it's something that I think, like I said, we'll, we'll have to look into and get back to you. Um, but that was kind of our initial thought is that the contacts themselves are, are dropping. Okay, I have see Zainab and then Taji. Taji's hand was up first. Oh. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, that's fine. I'll just go. Yeah, I, you say on uh, paragraphs remaining out of compliance, page 14, that you say additionally, specifically to paragraph 66B, some of the FDCRs and AARs we reviewed do not demonstrate that PBB officers displayed the skills needed to regularly resolve confrontations without resorting to force or to use the least amount of appropriate force. I'm wondering, you did mention already that you've reviewed their de-escalation training, or, or sorry, first question, do you, have you reviewed their most recent rendition of their de-escalation training? And uh, further, like, if they're still having issues, it could be just a matter of like the specific officers did not receive the de-escalation training this in-service cycle. So then how long have they done in de-escalation training if they if this is if they didn't get this year's rendition of it? And is it a continual training? Um, because it sort of shows some obvious discrepancies. Sure. They they incorporate elements of de-escalation in each year of the training that, that we've seen, um, including in the scenarios. Uh, so I, I don't know if it's if it's necessarily a, ma uh, a matter of officers haven't received the de-escalation training. Um, you know, like we said in, in the report, uh, in reviewing the after actions and then reviewing the FDCRs, we didn't see that consistently being demonstrated. Um, but I, I don't know if I'd go so far as say that it's because officers have not received de-escalation training. Um, yeah. Yeah, we don't know. I mean, they have gotten that refresher every year, but half of them didn't get it in 2020. So it's possible, you know, that it played some role. Does that beget that it doesn't work or that the idea of them incorporating it into the other aspects of their training de-escalation, that being that it's not doing the thing it's supposed to do, which is to show them how to not use force in incidents? I'm not, I'm not sure that it shows that de-escalation training doesn't work. <clears throat> Um, because again, when we reviewed the non-protest force events, uh, we do see uh, de-escalation uh, coming into play. Again, I, I think that what, what happened was the protest overwhelmed the PPB um, and that the, that the focal point of the protest response may not have been the same that would, would be a focal point of of your traditional you know, conventional. That makes sense. So does, is there a, in the plan to redress the lack of capacity 
PPB has in handling sort of anomaly cases of large protests, will there be a way to address the manner of de-escalation handled in such instances? We'll have to see the full comprehensive uh, after action review that they're currently doing right now. Uh, I, I would expect that those elements would be brought into it. Um, again, one of the things that that we had uh, you know, kind of hoped would happen was over the course of the protests that those intermittent after action reports uh, reviews would have happened um, to be able to look at at that. But as it is, we're, we're going to see a broader after action review of the entire event. Um, and I would expect that the de-escalation uh, potential and the de-escalation use and you know not use uh, would be addressed in that broader after action. I didn't mean just in the broader after action. I, I meant in the future trainings when they're going to be right. so they can better handle. Right. Is that what you meant though? Are they together? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, Thank that's you. a really good point. We'll keep an eye on that. I mean, they did some excellent de-escalation training before the uh, protests, but it does it historically in just Portland as well as other cities it has tended to focus not on crowds, but on individual encounters uh, with people with mental illness uh, issues, et cetera. And uh, so, and there is discussion of crowd work. There's a lot of planning and formation of lines and all that, but the de-escalation component of it really is important. So we'll keep an eye on that uh, this year. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Zainab and then Amy. Hi, thank you. It's Zainab Folk, she, her. I did have some similar questions. Um, and thanks for everyone else, including Dan, um, for making a point about um, the training piece. Because um, I did, I was wondering, I kept hearing if it was something that you did witness or you did not um, as a team. Um, to assess whether or not training online had shifted from um, training or any changes from training being done in person, um, which I could only imagine it could <laughs> for so many different reasons, um, but not knowing what that training actually looked like in 2020, um, I just would imagine you would want to um, observe what it is um, now. Um, and then I had a question and I'm putting it in. Before 2020, uh, when was the last recorded protest in Portland? And when, they, when you say recorded, I'm not sure what maybe the language of what a protest is defined as. Um, and only why I say that, because I, I recall seeing a protest in 2016, 2017, and I was wondering what um, has changed or shifted from that time in record. Um, and when you talk about excellent de-escalation training, um, what does that look like? Um, and especially when you know, I know I've seen several um, protests throughout, well, plus 40, almost 50 years. <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I'm just concerned about maybe not, I'm not understanding what is meant um, in the, language of protest and um, de-escalation and also training and, and making sure that the tactics that we have seen um, in the past, including in 2020, but prior to that, um, will look different and how will it look different and how has um, PPB um, shown that or, or, or how will you assess that it is that way? Thank you. I, I will defer to PPB as to when the last protest was, um, you know, and, and how often protests occur in Portland. Uh, just in terms of your other question, though, what does excellent de-escalation training with individuals mean? Uh, there's a number of different factors. One of them is giving time, space, and distance. Uh, one person, one officer talking at the same time, you know, at, at a time. Um, you know, showing empathy, giving giving the individual voice, um, and and having you know being able to say, I understand what you're going through, or even if I don't understand what you're going through, I understand that it's real to you. Uh, there's a lot of, particularly with crisis intervention, 
Uh, there, there are a lot of different de-escalation tactics. Um, and, and so I can, I, I can connect with you, at, you know, offline about what, what are those other de-escalation tactics that are traditionally taught, uh, both the crisis intervention as well as the broader, broader department. Um, but if uh, somebody from PBB wants to talk about when the last, when the last uh, protest was prior to this year, um, they would know much, not much better than me. I, we've seen protests during our tenure, but what the exact answer would be. And before you go to them, I, I prefer to um, hear from Coco, is that's what your team is called, right? Coco? Yes. Um, I wanna know, when's the last time you both have been in Portland when there was the, um, when the riots or protests, quote unquote, were going on or considered um, at the, I saw your graph at the um, height of the city. Um, were you both in town or saw or, or able to observe firsthand any of that yourselves? I came in October. Um, I did not see any uh, protests that evening. Uh, I did, I was able to walk downtown, um, but I, I was there in October. Yeah, we, we were not there, uh, although we've seen dozens of videos uh, of what happened and we've talked to a lot of people. Okay. Um, and in I do. Watching, in watching that, um, and why I'm going to go to, and yes, I'm probably, again, being that another person asking, in seeing that, you didn't think or determine that, you know what, since we're working on looking at this dissent decree um, with the city, let's go and make sure um, that they are um, doing what is needed. And in, in regards to the training, um, before they put people on the street who were not, um, what's the word I'm trying to use? I'm not trying to say qualified, but they were not trained, they were untrained. Or if they were trained, were they trained properly um, is the question. Well, you know, I, I think you're touching on something important, and I I, uh, I kind of alluded to it earlier. We have uh, the, this model, and Tom talked about part of this, the way uh, evidence-based training is done in de-escalation, and, but it's all been designed around individual encounters, as I said earlier. There has not been enough models that deal with these crowds. And honestly, I do think there needs to be a dialogue between you folks and the police about just how, how highly unusual it is and how you apply those same principles in that setting. It's very, very difficult. Uh, the reality, though, is I've insisted that as they move to virtual training, that this kind of training be in person, that some of these things you just can't do as well online. You can see videos of other people doing it poorly or sometimes people doing it well, which is a good start, but you have to practice it yourself. You have to be in scenarios. You have to be told by someone who is an instructor that you could have handled that differently. And you need people provoking you in practice. You put that thought, Dennis, what you just said, in the report itself? Uh, we have in the past. I think it's in this report too, but I'll make sure. Yeah, I, I think that's that's what's I'm I'm trying to make sure that we're while we're focusing all all while all of us are focusing on 2020, yeah. um, I know that there there um, been times throughout history where the PPB should know by now how to course correct or correct or understand what needs to happen to protect their community, um, and also um, I know. I know that Coco um, plays a, the mediary, I guess I would say, in, in this whole process between PSEP, the mayor, and um, PBB. I'm just, I'm trying to figure out where, where do, do, is it a balance that you, your team, um, do you have a hard time um, adjusting to? Um, and, and why I say that is that I hear your, so when you present your, your information, like when you make these presentations, because it's the second time I've been at a presentation that you've held, I hear what you're saying, but when I'm reading your reports, I don't see it the same way. I don't see it as um, assertive, assertive uh, let me just say it in that way. Um, to yeah, I hear you. I, we, we uh, you um, know, I did make a deal. You can find it in there when I, I I'm critical of, of virtual, 
I, I wasn't finished talk. I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just trying to finish my statement and I didn't have anything more to say after that because um, I've really been waiting for this meeting um, and I've been waiting to um, hear and see and understand what's been happening. Um, but I know that, you know, even within the next year, if it's, it's extended one more year, there has to be something that is going to help um, ensure that these type of things when it comes to um, a lot of things we talk about the attacks, the, um, it just doesn't feel right to, to see a report like this that doesn't really speak to the fact that um, there has to be more done. Thanks. Thank you, Zainab. So Dennis, do you want to respond? No, I, I hear what she's saying. And there, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of pain out there in terms of the way these things have gone down. Uh, and we, uh, I've said this before at other meetings, our, we're kind of constrained too in what we do because our job was laid out by this legal settlement agreement that says this is the way we're judging what they do. And, and, uh, and that's why I think PCEP's role is important. I think a tax role, I think there's a lot of uh, community uh, mental health groups and others that have to play step up here too and say what they like and don't like. And, and protests, as you know, uh, there's there's another side to it. I'm I'm pretty liberal myself, but there's a conservative side that says, God, the Portland police. The reason there's so much violence and stuff is they're not cracking down on the people who are not the protesters, but the ones who are causing trouble. And so the the city has struggled. I know your mayor has struggled with back and forth about how far to and, and what take tools to take away from the police, whether that's making it better or worse. I realize this is complicated, uh, but I do think there needs to be a dial. We should. We, there, the police should be allowed, the leaders of the police bureau to voice why they're doing what they're doing and whether you and us agree with them. And uh, it's not a, it's kind of a thankless position to be in, but, but you know, there's no excuse for some of the behavior we observed on some of those videos. And, and we pointed it out in our report. Uh, some of the reports written about, you know, didn't intend to hurt this person. Well, it kind of looked like you did, you know, so there's, there's various things that we've disagreed with uh, in the way they've handled the protests, but it's also more complicated than sometimes we make it out to be in these meetings. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Okay. Okay, so we've got Amy, Benjamin, and then Lakeana. Amy. Thank you all so much for coming and doing this report. As I sit here um, and think about everything, I just recently, Rewatched the movie Alien Boy. And I'll tell you, I was really taken back by um, the fact of all the brutality that has happened over the decades of, you know, being here and watching everything. Yes, there's been improvements. But something that I'm really curious about now is as you talk about trainings, Something that I get exposed to a lot in my job working with these population is something called a fidelity review or a fidelity report, which is meeting certain, um, you know, guidelines and, and some of them are pretty strict or pretty tough. So I'm wondering when you talk about trainings and you talk about CIT and de-escalation, what fidelity model do you use to determine whether or not the program is current or maybe needs an upgrade or, you know, like we can't keep doing the same old, same old, but who's going to say it's time to, you know, rewrite the information? So I'm going to pause because that's question number one. And question number two is, I didn't see anything in your information about racial equity um, trainings or programs or things that really highlight some of the major issues that have been um, going on. So I'm curious about those two things is, how do you judge a program is sufficient based on its, you know, fidelity review report. And where's the piece on racial equity trainings? So those are my two questions. Yeah, Amy, those are really good questions. And, uh, you know, we've always argued that you don't just get away with 
labeling something training under a particular topic, you have to demonstrate that it's good training. And that's what you're talking about with fidelity. And there's, there's all kinds of levels. I pushed this from the beginning in Portland about training. You teach people knowledge first, then you show them examples of what good behavior is, then you have them practice that behavior, then you give them feedback on that behavior. And it just doesn't cut it to have sort of talking head PowerPoint presentations, you know? And so you've got to have all these phases of training. To me, that's fidelity. And we've pushed them hard on that a lot. And then also there's, and it has to, the content has to be evidence-based, you know, like Tom was alluding to and others. There, there, we've learned a lot about procedural justice and, 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 and crisis intervention uh, with mental illness and, 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 and those fundamental principles of giving people time, listening to them, showing compassion, you know, on and on. And uh, when I first saw the crowd control ex exercises last year, I interrupted the instructor right away and said, you know, they're not showing enough procedural justice over there when they're doing what they're doing. And, you know, we've given them feedback on some of this stuff. But I think the, the other part of it is evaluation. You have to have systems in place. In Portland, we fought about this for two years, but they finally have some. You have to evaluate. Does the officer's knowledge change, first of all, before and after the training? Does their behavioral intentions change? Then when they're in the field, does their actual behavior change in terms of the way they de-escalate and use force? And uh, I, I still am disappointed that Portland does not have body-worn cameras. It's so important to be able to document what actually transpired. And uh, most cities have it that are on the cutting edge of what's going on in policing. And I would hope that you, that forces fighting against that will someday see that. Uh, but anyway, uh, I could go on and on, but uh, oh, racial equity you mentioned. Uh, uh, Portland has, you know, there is uh, some equity groups meeting and they have come up with videos uh, that they're planning to present uh, as part of training. Uh, where and, and people from the community, I, I don't know if you guys are involved in that at all, but are going to be participating in talking about their lived experience uh, with some of that. So um, I'm sure the uh, folks from this PPB can talk a little bit more about that or. So did I hear you say that right now there aren't any curriculum based programs operating under that subject matter? They're in development. Uh, I'm going to let the. I think they're part. They're definitely part of the 2021 in-service training plan. But they carry out one or two of these rather than hit the officers with them all at once. They do every month. They do one or two videos, uh, and and they've started them. I believe. I don't know if Mary Claire or someone else that's here can tell us if they've started yet. Wait a minute, you just said you're you just explain an awesome method of learning, yes, you know, previously, and I didn't hear right. you say that happening now. Uh, that that's yeah, okay, part, I, I got part, it, I got some, it. Some of it is, and some of it isn't, yeah. Amy, can I can I also add on to something that Dr. Rosenbaum was saying? Um, yeah. one of the uh, one of the fidelity metrics, though, is also you know, as, as Dr. Rosenbaum said, in the field. Um, and so that was one of the things that we had looked at was, are, are they occurring? And if they're not occurring, are supervisors identifying that? Um, and so in some of the after actions, after action reports that we reviewed, we had seen some of those things that would have been a part of training that were not being called out by the supervisors. Um, and so that's in the use of force section, that's where part of the uh, falling out of substantial compliance resulted from was it may not have been the training, it's that they're not being corrected in the field as well. Ah, so yeah, okay. So the mentorship isn't as strong as it could be then. Okay. Okay, thank you, um, Amy, and, and for the responses. Benjamin's up next and Lakiana, and I'm putting myself on the stack after that. So, Benjamin. Hi, um, this is Caitlin, actually, oh, Caitlin, we're on the same line, so sorry, it's a little confusing. Um, yeah, so many community members, including myself, are concerned that certain parts of the settlement no longer serve its original purpose. Um, in fact, we've noticed that it's gotten in the way in some of the very legitimate and urgent demands to defund the police bureau. Um, this includes reforms that were proposed by Commissioner Hardesty. So in a time when the community and the entire country are rethinking police budgets, it seems a little counterproductive to have a settlement that requires certain positions 
and specialty units to be funded. Um, I would say that should be determined by the community, especially as the city is required to by the budget that they voted on last year to do a review of specialty units. Um, it seems like the community should make those decisions. So basically this all to say, um, is it possible to renegotiate certain parts of the settlement? And what would that process look like? And I can also give examples of some of the areas in the settlement that um, are of concern to me at least. I, I believe that the Department of Justice would be better uh, situated to answer that question. They are the plaintiffs in the case. Uh, we are just a role that's assigned in the settlement agreement in terms of negotiating the settlement agreement. That would be a question for our colleagues at the Department of Justice. Okay, so phone a friend. Jared, are you there? I am here. Uh, do you want to respond to the possibility of renegotiation? Yeah, uh, so there is a process for uh, changing the terms of the agreement. It has, uh, we've gone through it once and we're actually still in the middle of that process. Uh, we had agreed on seven amendments uh, in 2016 and six of them have been approved and one has been conditionally approved. The process for doing that is it really starts with the city and if they want to renegotiate a, a particular provision, uh, they need to propose that to the Department of Justice. Um, for any amendment to be approved, it has to be uh, approved by city council. And that's a big hurdle. Uh, once city council approves something, we would uh, of course consider uh, the needs of the community. But I do wanna make one point about the settlement. Uh, it, you know, This is a civil rights action and there is a certain counter majoritarian um, uh, view in civil rights that, uh, you know, the city and the department came to an agreement in, in 2012 approved by the court in 2014. And it does bind future city councils. And for good reason, because you can imagine an alternate scenario where, you know, changes that the majority might like would be onerous to the rights of minorities. Now I, I do take the point about the you know the overall purpose of the agreement and if there were you know especially units that the city doesn't want um, that are mandated by the settlement agreement or if they want to reform them uh, they need to come forth with that proposal and i think it's certainly up for the community to you know suggest those um, proposals um jared could i just ask a follow-up about that would the new accountability body that's going to be formed and blowing up IPR require a renegotiation of the agreement according to your understanding of it? Well, I don't think I'm authorized to, to say, <laughs> you know, for the department, what it's going to require now. I, I can say that, you know, the department wants to meet with the city about this agreement. That's why we aren't in a position to, to comment tonight. Uh, so we want to meet with the city about the, the report and remedial measures, and, and we'll do that in the next couple of weeks. And I, I'm sure that the city might be wanting to discuss um, potential implications of the, the new uh, body. But I, I can say, you know, um, that I think the compliance officer, you know, noted that the settlement agreement does bind future iterations of uh, oversight agencies. So if it's not IPR and it's going to be some new board, it does need to be consistent with the settlement agreement or the city needs to propose an amendment that you know they can approve through city council and that um, embodies the spirit of the agreement and i think the department would uh, consider that and you know very carefully and, and in all likelihood would agree if they were good good ideas thank you um so lakiana your hand is up next thank you and thank you dr rosenbaum and dr christoph for being here um Kind of a good follow-up question to what was just stated. I'm curious just to hear what you see as the end game of all of this um, as we enter year number six or seven of the settlement agreement. Um, and obviously being very close to seeing it completed and then having it fall off. And then, you know, there's questions of renegotiating it or restructuring it and just all these different moving pieces and what you all see is the end game or just any insights on that um and how do you think that we move forward because one of the things that 
feels to be the case is that the city is in a different position, uh, in a different climate than what it was when the settlement agreement initially came in place, not necessarily better, but um, one that is, uh, yes, just different, more intense, and especially with regards to racial justice and the current settlement agreement, not mentioning race. And then how you guys, is this a follow-up to that, just how you all see your role currently versus what your role was during the initial part of the settlement agreement in the early years of it? Wow, that's a tough question, Lakiana, but it's a good one. Um, you know, well, first of all, back in the day when we started this, there was a lot of, as I've said before, intense meetings and debates and arguments and people trying not to raise their voice about making change in everything, you know, from policy to, to training, um, to accountability. And uh, I know this is hard for some of you to believe, but the city has made significant progress, the Portland Police Bureau in these areas. It doesn't necessarily mean that behavior changes out in the field, that's another issue. Um, but I think probably it has, but you're right. I mean, I, there are things I would have done differently if I had written the settlement agreement. And uh, you know, it doesn't give much attention to racial justice. Although, as you know, I've pretty much brought it up passing in every one of our reports as I did tonight. Um, and um, I think that our end game at this point um, is to just see that the terms that they've, they've made it to the finish line on each of these areas. And I think they're close in so many areas. I do agree with some of the sentiment that at some point this uh, has run its course and that I, I said this last time I spoke here and I'll say it again, which is that uh, Portland at some point should be allowed to regulate itself without the outside intervention of the Justice Department or the COCOL. And um, on the one hand, it was, it was helpful to begin with because the bringing DOJ in and there's just a lot of clout behind that and a lot of authority. And uh, we're doing this in Chicago to some extent now, we, they're making them reform and they have years and years to go. But, you know, I think Portland, uh, uh, you know, there's only so much far you can go and it doesn't cover much of re-envisioning or re the police. Uh, and, um, you know, I don't like, the, the word defunding is, is, well, I mean, some, there's definitely, room in policing, as I've said for years, for a lot of these functions to be discussed in other ways. Mental health is a good example where people and um, other models are being considered. Uh, so uh, we hope that you keep moving ahead in all these areas uh, with or without us. Uh, we don't wanna get in the way. Uh, I do, that's, there's a potential for that with some of these things. And I know the person who spoke earlier, she didn't, get a chance to give any examples, uh, but I, maybe she was referring to IPR and the new uh, work that's going on in there where there may be conflict at some point. But, but Jared made it clear too that as long as the work doesn't conflict with the settlement agreement where the lawyers get upset, then everything should be fine. And this should be brought to a logical conclusion. I'm hoping 2021 is a really good year for the city to to be in compliance on a lot of these things, but we're going to call balls and strikes no matter what. I'm not going to back down on that. Luckily, yeah. I, I will also say that I think the settlement agreement is 160, 170 paragraphs of actionable items. Uh, I would hate to think that the police bureau could only focus on those items and those items alone. So if there's other areas outside of the settlement agreement, uh, and there certainly are areas outside of the settlement agreement that are important. Um, you know, as Dr. Rosenbaum just said, those areas can continue. Those areas should be continued. Um, our, our role is just those 160, 170 actionable uh, paragraphs to evaluate. Thank you. Um, so I had myself on the stack and then I see Zainab has her hand raised and Barb in the chat had indicated she had a question. So my, my question and it's a concern is over um, 
the disproportionate policing, um, your comments, which indicated that there wasn't disproportionate policing in terms of traffic stops. And in survey after survey, the most recent being 538, um, did an analysis and it was published. OPB did a report I just put in, oh wait, I just sent that to Barb, um, in the chat in which they did a comparison of Portland to countries, to cities across the country and found that Portland has the fifth worst arrest disparity rate in the entire nation. And the benchmarks, I know the benchmarks that the PPB use and I find them absolutely ridiculous like using traffic stops and using other kinds of benchmarks other than the um, one which is typically used across the country which is presence in the population and fishing for benchmarks to try to come up with evidence that there's not disproportionality, I think is bad social science and it's bad faith because in so many reports by academics, um, so many reports by, um, by neutral think tanks, um, we've seen the same data over and over again over the years and it's extreme disproportionality um, in terms of arrests, in terms of traffic stops down the line, including what you're talking about in terms of the searches. But I would encourage you not to rely on the benchmarks that the PVB is using and to rely on ones that social scientists use and to look at that report by 538 that finds um, extreme disproportionality in Portland policing. So if, I don't know if you wanna respond to that in terms of benchmarks. Wow, that's a tough one. You guys are asking hard questions tonight. I just wanna relax and have a glass of wine. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, you know, uh, Elliot, I'm, for, I spent much of my life talking about disparities and in racial injustice and, you know, uh, mass incarceration, you know, that what we've done to the black community in America is appalling. And uh, there is, we're just, you know, I'm old enough that I went through this 60s and the civil rights movement and I've been here before. But my point is, um, I, we could have a long debate. We can't do it now about benchmarks. I do think there's some merit in benchmarks because, uh, you you know, is the, is it bias or is it uh, is it legitimate enforcement? The problem, largely, I think, is and by the way, persons in the population is not, you know, considered a legitimate benchmark too. That's the problem because, but it but it's it's better than nothing. It's a lot better than nothing. Um, but but my my point is I think we we need this is I'm speaking now outside of the settlement agreement outside of I'm just talking about my experience and my background uh, that what's going on what's wrong with policing is about the strategies for controlling crime and that we rely on what we call hotspots policing and other strategies of putting more and more police officers in high crime areas. There is, um, uh, and what that results in is uh, lots of stops and arrests and all of that. And there is more crime in some of the low income neighborhoods of color because of all this structural inequality and disadvantage over hundreds of years. And then continuing to this day in healthcare and everything and housing and jobs and, 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 and police are brought in to sort of solve this problem. Well, that's not going to cut it. So, the strategy of putting more police and and rewarding police for, you know, for behaviors in in these neighborhoods is not the solution to the crime problem in America. And it further, uh, we now know we have dozens of studies showing the adverse collateral damage of having a felony arrest on your record and going to jail. Uh, you can't get jobs, you can't do this, you can't do that. So you're further in economic inequality as a result of that. So we have to come up with different ways of thinking about it. I've written a lot previously about preventing crime, informal social control. How do you build the capacity of an organization, a neighborhood to regulate itself? So there's a lot of things, and this may be part of the re-envisioning police too. Uh, but uh, I think it's a bigger issue, the disparity issue. It's about the way we go about solving our problems.
Okay, well, we could agree to disagree, but I just think one of the problems that I have is finding some common ground about looking at facts. And I think you could ask any one African-American person in Portland, you could ask anyone who has experienced police in Portland and they will tell you that they're experiencing disproportional policing. I think the data bears that out and to have yes. the PPV and to have Cocal deny that um, just like makes okay. me feel like we're not having the same conversation. So we could okay. have this conversation about benchmarks offline. Um, but thank I you. I hear for what you're saying. Yeah, no, I hear what you're saying. It's a, it's, it's a good point. And I'm a psychologist by training. There's a lot of research showing that we're all biased. We have implicit and explicit biases. Police are biased. And they, and that's the nature of what's, there's definitely something going on. Whether, you know, we, the benchmarks are the right. I was just reporting what they had reported on those benchmarks. Uh, and, uh, but you, you know, do we want to take a stronger stand on that? That's, I hear what you're saying. Okay. Um, so Barb, do you want to uh, ask your question? Sorry, we're sharing, she's sharing my mic and her computer screen. Go ahead. So anyway, hi. My question is, has the CIT curriculum been updated since it was originally rolled out? The curriculum, Dr. I'm not sure how to say her name. Elizabeth, Elizabeth Garrison? Garrison? Is that her name? Um, or? Wrote for that? Do you understand what I'm asking? When you're saying rolled out, do you mean when they first started doing any CIT 40-hour training? Yes. When was No, I don't mean that. I mean, when was the last time it was updated then? So, you know, like 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, whatever. Um, I know that it, it went through the BHUAC uh, who provided some recommendations. I, I can't remember... Um, whether those comments led to it being updated. I know that it, it is reviewed on a regular basis um, with with Dr. Garrettson. Uh, Mary Claire, you might- revised. Sure. Um, Mary Claire, do you know the last time it was- Revised, revised is a better word. In any capacity <laughs> or- yeah, I know she does review it every year, but Mary Claire, if you've got if you've got a more uh, definitive answer on any revisions that have been done, uh, all I can tell you is that they do each year look at it, and in fact, they are going through a major revision right now. She and Officer um, from the um, BHU. So yes, it has not remained static. They um, change it up you know, um, often based on, you know, best practices. And I, I will say that- Thanks I, for being so quantitative, Mary Claire. I, I will say though too, that I, I know Dr. Garrettson goes to the annual CIT conferences that uh, people from PPB go to the annual CIT conferences. There's a consistent, uh, you know, best practices continuously get updated. Um, and, and I believe that those updates uh, are reflected in the in the 40 hour, um, as well as the refresh portrait um, that ECIT officers have gone through. I don't know that we can speak for the State Academy for the revisions that they have made um, to their portion of the 40 hours that all uh, that all officers get. Uh, but yeah, there, there's everything continues to be updated as as people learn and as you know the the general academic sense uh, continues to evolve. Uh, Barb, are you concerned that it, there's problems with that training? I'm not sure because I haven't been around long enough to, I, I don't know enough about the training to say that. And yeah. it's really awesome that nobody was killed last year by the Portland PB. Although it's sad that now there's other jurisdictions where we're seeing the same problems. Um, I refer to it as cops carrying guns to knife fights um, and just not being able to de-escalate or have somebody there to de-escalate 
the situation. Um, so I don't think, I'm pretty darn sure it's not ECIT officers that um, are having the issues. I'm pretty sure it's the regular officers that you're seeing those issues with or the non-ECIT non officers or whatever you wanna call it. Um, so that's why, <clears throat> that's why I'm asking. Um, but I also know that, I mean, as, as I said, as I said before, it was rolled out a while ago, um, but I totally get that it's, you know, that the first, you know, that it's been up, updated. I just think it needs to be continually updated. Um, and yeah. Okay. I, I can tell you just what we know, but Dr. Gerritsen's very impressive. I, I, I've been very impressed with her, so. I think she yeah, should. Yeah, I'm sitting here with Amy account. and Amy knows her. So, yeah. I met her when she worked at the county. She's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So, and Barb, when you get a chance uh, on, on page 12 of our report, we do provide some statistics. Uh, so, in a 30 month period between April 1st of 2018 and September 30th of 2020, uh, officers had responded to over 54,000 calls for service involving a person with actual or perceived mental illness. Um, of those 54,000 calls, force was only used approximately 400 times, so 0.74%. Um, and the majority of those were category four, which is the lowest level of force uh, that's categorized by PPB. Um, as it relates to the settlement agreement, um, Category two and category three force types are only used in 144 interactions, which is 0.27% of all the interactions of persons with actual or perceived mental illness. Does it separate the ECIT officers from the other officers when that goes down, you know, with those statistics? And I think I've seen a few things where it does, but I think that's a huge distinction. And I also think it's really hard to be able to survey the people that they come in contact with um, because people don't even really know that they're that they're dealing with an ECIT officer a lot of the time. Sure. Or they've been dealt with by or whatever. Thank you though. Okay, so we have two hands. I see Zainab and then Lakiana, if that's a new hand, oh, that's an old hand. So Zainab, um, and we're coming up on time, so maybe you could have the last question or word. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I was listening to you, um, Dennis Ros Rosenbaum and Tom Kristoff. I was listening to both of you. And I listened to you both um, at the first time I attended one of these meetings when you presented. and. I really didn't pay much attention um, because I was just learning. And so it was a lot going on. Um, but there were some questions that I've, I've, I'm having really more about your team itself. Um, so Coco, um, can you tell me how many people on your team is there on your team? Who had, who had collaboration or any type of um, support in this um, report? Uh, there's uh, Amy, Tom, myself. There's uh, six of us. Okay. And so one of the things I listened to you and you said about um, biases, we all have them. I was just wondering, just occurred to me, how many of your team are persons of color? Um, right now, uh, there is not anybody of color on our team. Okay. No, Ash Ashley Heiberger. Well, Ashley is, um, yeah. Ashley, she's on your team and she worked She worked on the report as well. I take that back, yes. Okay, um, and she is of the BIPOC community or? He is, yes. It's he actually. Okay, he is of yeah. the community? Yeah, BIPOC, yeah. Great, and so when you stated um, that there was implicit biases, cause I had to go, that's one I thing I did after I had asked a question. Mm -hmm. uh, Looking at your report about how many times you um, mentioned racism mm -hmm. here, and it was only once. Mm -hmm. I saw mental illness, you know, 10 times. However, sure. um, I just listened to you, your response to Lockheed. Sure. 
I listened to your response um, to Lakiana. And one of the things I heard you say is, you know, you don't, I'm not sure if I heard this right, but you don't feel like there's really much really we can do about the police bureau and their, I, that's, I'm not sure if that's what you're you were intending to say. Mm -hmm. um, did sound as if you were saying that as all you can do is what we've been, what you've been able to do. Um, and to say that, you know, Portland has done better given when, like when did they start, you know, measuring this, 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 um, their incidents um, in the communities like they do now. And so I'm just, I would just say in listening to you and I'm, and I'm gonna say it like this. Mm -hmm. I didn't start thinking about your team until I learned how much money you get for your reporting and for your work that it now makes me un wonder, you know, what's happening and what is your role um, with this whole process and how can you and your team support change? And do, do you feel like you're here to do that, to support change? Um, are, are you done? So I don't want to interrupt you this time. Yes, I'm done. Um, is it Dr. Rosenbaum? Because I don't want to disrespect. You don't have to call me Dr. Rosenbaum. Yeah, I do have a PhD. But, um, is Dr. Rosenbaum, and yes, I think we all would like to be at home. I mean, I am in my home and I'm not drinking wine, but I would love to be drinking wine as well. But I do find this particular issue um, in our community because I do want to see um, change. Yeah. Um, I think lives depend on it. And yeah. not the lives today of the, our elders, so, our adults, but yeah. all young people who are watching us and are, are learning from us. And so I, I just want you to understand that when you do respond to yeah. um, understand that. Thank you. Yeah, I will respond. Thank you. Um, I totally understand. Uh, I have uh, members of my family that have been discriminated against. I have people of color in my family. Um, I do care about Portland. I grew up in Portland. I'm not doing this job uh, for money. Uh, you'll see that most of the big contractors never even wanted to be involved in this because they make five times as much as we're making in Portland, five times as much on average. Um, so um, that's point number one. Um, I do care a great deal about Portland. I went, if you were here in the beginning, when we started six years ago, you would see that this project, there was frustration about it by AMAC and others that it was about mental health. It was not about race. And that's the way it was designed. Yes, there's some race in there, here and there, not enough in today's standard, no question about it. Uh, and I've tried to keep that on the burner. I do cover it to some extent. I don't, I talk about bias, but, and I, I do know a lot about bias. I, I've taught courses on this. I, I have everything. I have a hundred books on prejudice and racism. Um, but uh, so it's a big issue for me. My own grandchildren are African-American. Uh, so uh, I've marched in other cities. I do care a great deal, but I'm, I'm here uh, to try to do what we agreed to do. And hopefully we'll be done at some point. Uh, but, uh, and I don't think, you know, joking about having a glass of wine, I just, I'm sorry I said that. <clears throat> okay, well, thank you, um, Dennis and Tom and everyone for their keen and perceptive questions. Um, hopefully you can incorporate some of this feedback into the report and um, I encourage people who might have thoughts after this meeting to just send them along to um, Dennis or Tom by email um, so that they can uh, incorporate them into their report and it's I just want to say it's tough to talk about this stuff because we don't all necessarily agree and this is a matter of life and death for many people in our, our community so um, so it's hard and but thank everyone for keeping an open mind and uh, Elliot, listening. Yeah, Elliot, I don't, don't want to interrupt you but can I can sure. I say something quickly um I really appreciate as well, everyone being here tonight. I didn't hear an answer um, uh, to uh, Zainab's question that I heard. Are you here to 
to influence change or support change. Those are my words. I didn't say it as eloquently as she did. Can you answer that before we move on? Well, how would you word the question again, Anne? Uh, it was Zainab's uh, question, and um, maybe she could word it again. Um, it was about, are you here to, to, uh, to help us change? Are you here to uh, help us influence change? Zainab, can you, uh, I'm not no, doing- I, I understand. You are, uh, where, where, you, are, you are there, and I think he does understand where you're coming from now. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Uh, as long, I, we, first of all, I do believe, I wouldn't want to say I wasted five years of my time here. Uh, I do believe that things are better off than they were in some areas. The mental health thing, there haven't been as many problems in the last year at all. And that was the main focus. And I do believe the Portland Police Bureau, they're sick of me talking about procedural justice and, and the kind of training they need to do and all this stuff. Um, but I think they've changed. And so I think, I do believe that that will help the community in the end. When you train, procedural justice is all about equity and fairness. And I do think that it may make a difference in the long run. We don't turn these things around overnight. Did, could we have made more of the race inequity? Uh, possibly, but I felt it was, you know, I was doing it indirectly and it just wasn't part of the, the settlement agreement, the way they structured it. I don't know why that is the way it was. I wasn't involved in that, but uh, I do feel badly about that. And we will keep that issue going. And I respond to, to what you folks are saying tonight. I don't know if that answers your question. You know, okay. I'm going to say this and I'm going to end here. Um, when you say that after 2020, after seeing everything happen in 2020 and that yeah. you had an opportunity, an opportunity as a team, to bring that issue up, even in his own addendum, even his own, <laughs> we get a page about it. How about that? We, oh, we did in our in our third quarter report. We talked about it quite a bit. Not on where? Which report are we on now? Court, fourth quarter. Thank you. I'm just I'm just saying being consistent to me is really important, and I understand the fact that you are not doing this for the money. I get, but at the same time, when I heard the budget. It's like, you know what, can, can we just get a level of understanding here? Um, and I think while people are talking to me privately, you know, I, I, I wish that they would really bring their point up to you both. And I will just say this, just because, yes, lovely that you have friends, family who are of the BIPOC community, um, but um, that's not what we're talking about here. And I hope that you don't um, leave here thinking um, that um, what we're talking about is me as a child. I grew up in Portland. You know, I grew up on a corner where they dropped possums outside of and was part of the protest then. Okay, I saw my city upside down. Um, people that look like me being choked to death. Um, and so when I say this to you, and I'm not saying no, things have not changed in different ways, but we're saying about right now what your responsibility is to this community. Um, is to bring the issues up at your level. You have a voice in this in this process that is recorded, is being recorded. Um, and you have the responsibility, I believe, to ensure that it's recorded accurately. And so I'll just leave it there. And thank you again, and thank you both. Yeah. Zina, do you mind if I if I respond a little bit to, to your comments? I think they're valid, um, but I just wanted to give a uh, quick uh, thank you. Um, I think one of the things that um, you know we we've said tonight, and that, that Dr. Rosenbaum was also saying, uh, is when there's issues related to race, or when there's issues related to uh, disproportionate policing, when there's issues related to over policing, we we support um, we, we support the efforts to to make to make policing as equitable as possible. Our arge, we like I said before, we we have, you know, maybe 170 things that the settlement agreement says, Cocal team, please look at it. Um, outside of that, and there are, like I said before, there are many, many issues outside of the small number of things that we've been asked to review. 
um, that we can support, that we can have a position on for this report and for our prior reports and our reports going forward. Um, we, we do not have any authority to force PPB to do something. We can talk about it in conversation. We can, we can ask that everybody on the PSEP bring them up as part of the body that should be going forward after the settlement agreement is done. Um, because, we, because the settlement agreement was about mental illness and, and response to mental illness, our, our focus certainly is on that. Um, but I, I would I would hesitate to to draw that comparison and say that we don't care about the treatment of people of color that we don't care about all these other things we do and we we address that stuff and a lot of the other work that we do it's just in Portland uh, we we have a a strict number of things that that we can comment on that we can provide technical assistance on and that doesn't mean that we don't have any other ideas. It just means that our our responsibility is about those that that set of items that's found within the settlement agreement. Okay, well, thank you. We're going to have to move on because we're already a little bit behind. So I'm going to pass it on to Taji to facilitate the next section. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And um, so we'll now be talking about the settlement agreement policy subcommittee's recommendation on the uh, public safety support specialist program with PPB. Um, and Claudia, oh, thank you, Vadim. And so I'll, I'll hand it over to Vadim. And, and this also includes if you wanted to bring in uh, Sean Campbell from TAC. All right, thanks, Taji. Uh, so what kind of engendered this is uh, conversations I've had with both Sean um, as part of the Training Advisory Council leadership, as well as uh, with community members uh, reading from Portland Cop Watch and their recommendations around uh, public support safety specialists. And everywhere I went, discussions we had about um, how to change the Portland Police Bureau to reduce violence, to reduce especially um, use of deadly force, you hear two things. One is Portland Street response, and the second is public safety support specialists. And the Portland Street response just started a, really a couple of weeks ago in Lentz with one van, so we're going to see how that evolves over time. But the PS3s have been around for a couple of years now. Um, so there's some experience about how they fit into the greater Portland community and what they've been doing with respect to um, kind of de-escalating some of the encounters between police and, and community members that need help. So um, the Portland Street response, um, for those that don't know, I'm sorry, the, the public safety support specialists, for those that don't know, are individuals um, who, uh, focus on lower level non-emergency calls, um, assisting community members with livability complaints, things like that. They're not armed. Um, they do have pepper spray, but um, they don't have a police uniform. Um, their dress code consists of a polo t-shirt, work pants. They don't drive in a police vehicle. They have a van with the city of Portland logo. Um, and uh, as mentioned, uh, they've been around since 2018. There's about 10 currently in service um, and they have various tasks such as uh, reporting involving uh, uh, stolen vehicle reports. Um, that's about 46% of their tasks. 27% are theft reports. 5% of their tasks involve follow-up. 4% uh, are vandalism reports and then 14% just other general duties. Um, and I've actually had an individual, uh, uh, a friend of mine who needed some help in the old town, Chinatown area and a PS3 individual came along and that was a very positive experience. Um, so which leads to this recommendation. Um, it's pasted in the chat box for anybody that has not had an opportunity to uh, read over it just yet. But the gist of it is um, asking the Portland Police Bureau to expand the use of PS3s um, and, and in a twofold sort of way. One is expanding it physically, which is to hire more PS3s. So when people call for services that might not require um, an individual that can lawfully make arrests or otherwise uh, be in possession of firearms in order to perform their duties, um, that perhaps an unarmed individual can be sent out there um, to deal with uh, that particular call. 
And the second part of that is to do a, uh, an analysis over time about what kind of calls uh, go through the 911 system, perhaps a 311 system, and uh, um, what kind of calls uh, PS3s can go out and do versus uh, armed police officers. So an estimation by the Training Advisory Council is possibly 25% to 30% of calls could be handled by unarmed officers or unarmed individuals who are not officers. Um, you know, that'll take time to determine, but that's part of the study. And then also um, getting feedback from community members as to the interactions with PS3s and um, how they felt about that in order to make sure that the program is one that uh, is, is getting the results that are needed and also that the community is getting um, the value out of the program as well. So um, that, is, that is the gist of the recommendation. Um, yeah, so I'll open it up to um, any questions or comments um, from PSEP and the community at this point. Does anyone from, I don't know if the hand raise function works on my end, it does. Um, Elliot, would you have any, would you have a question or thoughts? Sure, um, if no one else has a question. So this all sounds good, like in the spirit of Portland Street response, moving away from armed officers. I'm just wondering why this has to be housed in the Portland Police Bureau if we're talking about um, a response which seems to be about de-escalation about addressing people's um, social needs, then uh, I can imagine lots of other bureaus that might be in a better position um, and wouldn't have the baggage of the PPV, which has a particular culture and training. And so I'm just wondering what the logic is for housing these officers in the PPV. Okay. So let me let me see if I can kind of field that question, and then um, Sean, I think, wanted some time to speak, so I'll, I'll also uh, kind of pin that for him to answer as well. But part of that is that it's already housed within the Portland Police Bureau, and so that there's a level of training that's involved to make sure that such individuals um, know what they're doing, de-escalation training, bias training, all that stuff is things that they they go through, and and not a too dissimilar uh, fashion with what was discussed earlier from the COCO report that there are certain trainings that over time have been presented in order to um, better the police bureau, but certainly those trainings overlap with some of the PS3 um, functions as well. And then also there's that overlap wherein um, a call might start off with a PS3 service, but might be handed off to a police officer. So the fact that there's um, some similarities in the things that they handle um, and also uh, in, in the way that things can escalate over time, that there's um, um, kind of a benefit from being in the same uh, um, entity at least. Now I have recommended here as well as, as TAC, I believe that in the future, like once the PS3 program is evaluated and perhaps expanded, um, that other organizations should be able to provide input on how the PS3 program is run. Um, you know, I mentioned PSEP and TAC, of course, since we're kind of uh, doing the community aspect of this and some of the other things, but also Portland Cop Watch, Albina Ministerial Alliance for Coalition, Coalition for Justice and Police Reform, Mental Health Alliance and things like that. So there is room to grow um, and, and, you know, where it's housed can be a, a question as well. But I think right now, because it's already within um, PPB and the training is something that PPB is giving that um, to have it start from scratch at a different entity might be a little um, counterproductive to growing it and seeing if it's uh, successful in a bigger form. That is my thought. Um, Anne, uh, would you have a... Yes, I have a question. Um, is, is the PS3 program kind of seen as a first step in someone who's interested in becoming an officer? And currently, how many people are in the PS3 program? So I'll, I'll answer that second question first. The first one, I honestly, I don't know. Um, the, uh, there are 12 spots available. I think there are 10 PS3s that are actually employed by the city. 
um, and with respect to uh, whether or not they want to be officers, um, this is something I remember slightly reading from the attack report. Some do want to be officers, some don't want to be officers. Um, some don't want the stigma of becoming a police officer, but they want to be able to help out. Um, again, if we can put a pin in that and then Sean can maybe address it, but that's, that's what I recall from the uh, training advisory council discussions about this. And uh, Zainab, uh, would you have a comment or a question? Yes, thank you. Um, how many police calls altogether? I mean, Percentage-wise, I understand, but how many police calls does PBB get um, in a year um, that are considered that could be handled by this PS3 program? So in 2019, I believe PPB received about 360,000 calls for service. Uh, and the estimation of 25 to 30% might be something that unarmed individuals, uh, unsworn officers might be able to go out and respond to. Um, that, that would be 80,000. So talking about, so it's, it's more than just 10 or the 12 that you just mentioned to Ann. Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, quite a bit more. I would think we need to respond if that were the case. Oh, no, no, in your report. Okay, so I'm trying to figure out who are the PS3 officers? Oh, in there. oh uh, the, so there's 10 uh, public support safety specialists um, that have gone through the training and are currently employed. Um, and then, like I said, they mostly respond to uh, stolen cars, taking reports, theft reports in general. Okay, I understand that, but you just mentioned that there's 9,000, could be 9,000 cases. How many are they take actions on, do you know of? Like, that's a lot of cases for 10 people, don't you think? And is there a budget aligned? Do, do we already talk about this? At the, I'm sorry if I'm bringing up more things from our the other meeting, but is there a budget aligned for this new process? So yeah, that's, those are both really good points and, and good questions. So uh, I don't really know how many calls that 10 people um, actually answer, but certainly not the 90,000 that uh, the, the TAC at least estimates might be available. Um, and uh, that would, that's part of the reason why, you know, we're asking for the expansion of the PS3 so they can answer more calls down the road. And with respect to budget, no, and there's not a budget for that at all, which is why in my recommendation, um, I, I put that um, there be additional funds available to expand the PS3 so that they can answer these calls and so that, you know, there's fewer people out there with guns um, interacting with community members. Um, you know, the police budget is being cut by about 10% right now and um, a large part of that cut went to such things as uh, traffic. Um, so there's not going to be as many people out there for DUIs. Um, yep. Organized crime was cut. Uh, behavioral health unit was cut. Child abuse services were cut. Meeting. So, oh, I don't want to. I had more to my question. I was at the meeting, so I'm not sure if you're mentioning for everyone else. I was at that meeting, and at that meeting, we talked about the youth. And I remember you bringing someone else on who also spoke about, you know, how are youth being treated within your recommendations, and how would they be treated by the PS3? Would it be different? Anyone under 18 or considered um, a child? Under law. Uh, and I, I didn't realize I was one of your questions. Um, I, I don't know if the PS3s are actually sent to deal with uh, youth specifically. Like I said, right now they're being sent to deal with uh, stolen cars and theft reports. Yes, but in, at the last meeting, you said that you were going, you were going to look into that. That's when you first presented the information on the PS3 recommendation. And you also said you were going to add additional language to there. Did you, were you able to add additional language as well? I don't recall saying I was going to add additional language. Okay. So what additional language would I add about the, the youth aspect? Like they, they, they get called right now for stolen cars. So I don't know whether they, they're not there to arrest youth or deal with youth. They just go out to take reports from people. And how high is this a priority on our um, goals this year of passing this recommendation? I don't know if this is a priority or not a priority. I just, this is something that I think a lot of people have been um, hoping to see. Um, I've certainly heard a lot about it and there, there seems to be a consensus that this is an area of unarmed individuals 
um, to deal with issues that are not the best avenue for armed individuals to deal with. But I don't know what the priority would be. Okay, thank you, Vadim. I guess my last thing would say is that in your report, you mentioned there was a lot of people who are, that's your course of, course of people. You don't list them or attach them or even have recommendations by them or letters by them. Is that something you're planning on doing? Is getting their alignment with this as well? Or is it just piece that making this, making this recommendation? Thank you. Um, well, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by that. Do you, do you want me to go to other organizations, have them make similar recommendations or I'm not sure I get your just there? I have language in the chat. I'm trying to navigate everything. Um, it says here, a chorus of community organizers, individuals, and elected officials have, a, have called for reform within the PPB to reestablish public trust and legitimacy. And so when you start off with this paragraph, are they in, are they in alliance or with the PS3 as one of those things that they're recommending? I mean, uh, yeah, that, of course, a community, we've, we've been here for quite a few months and of course, the community organizations have asked for uh, more public trust and legitimacy. I think that's one of the reasons why PSEP is um, here and, and talking with the community to kind of get to that point um, to list just a few organizations that to my understanding do support the PS3 program and, and have issued um, information about that. You know, Portland Cop Watch certainly has. Right, so you um, yeah. You're planning on getting. I'm sorry, I, I I was I was talking also, but um, do, am I going out to Portland Cop Watch and ask them to make recommendations? I'm I'm not doing that. I'm doing this on behalf of PSEP. You're not gonna put their. You're not gonna put them on your recommend like as I've seen it on other recommendations that we have looked to align and partner with others in the community. So I was hoping to see hear you say you're planning on doing the same, and to me I think that makes it stronger. You know, as a recommendation to the um to the city as well to show alignment with other organizations is not just having your name or PSA um on there. That's my that's my recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I did receive a note from Portal Cop Watch not to speak on themselves. So if I misspoke, uh, uh, Mr. Handelman, about how you view the PS3s, please correct me. I, I um did read your recommendation or your feedback on the PS3 program. So I, I thought there was alignment there, but uh, of course there might not be. Um, Sean, um, I know I spoke a little bit here and try to field some of the questions the best I can, but I think you have some expertise. If we can maybe have um, a little bit of input from you on this, and then um, I, I'd also like to open it up to public comment. Um, I still have a public comment question as well. I'm okay. wondering about the budgetary aspect of the PS3 and with already sort of struggling budgetary issues within PPB, how would this sort of not only would this be redressing that and trying to be the solution to the lack of resources that they're the, the lack of funding that they're having with the deficit they'll have this year or where is the money planning to come from yeah that's a good quite question Taji and this is something I, I wrestled with as well and I try to find kind of a middle ground because um the recommendation from TAC came out about the PS3s and uh, you know I've spoken about the budgetary uh, impacts of that with the PPB budget uh, uh, committee and there, there's PPB is saying there's no money to hire PS3s because they've already um, had an impact of 24 million in their budget up until today and then another 10 million is being cut um, in, in this next fiscal year um, and they've already started reducing services because of that uh, and so the the, the other side to that is there seems to be a desire on behalf of PPB to, at least my understanding, to increase this program as well, but the funding needs to be there. And so um, I'm, in my mind, is trying to balance the needs of community members to have um, some other alternative, but also so that victims that are calling 911 and need a response can get a response. And if they're cutting behavioral health unit and things like that in order to deal with the budget as it is, what else would they need to cut to get the PS3s? So uh, once again, in my mind, it's the uh, perfect being the enemy of the good at this point. If we can get more PS3s out there, 
and they can show that this is something that they can deal with and there's fewer violence and fewer uses of force out there, then I think that's a benefit to all. So I kind of hit the middle road there and said, yeah, maybe if you can find more money for the PS3s, do it. That's up to the elected officials, you know, in their budgetary aspects to do that. Um, but I don't, I don't see it really starting up based on the conversations I have unless there's some money to go along with it. So that's sort of where my issue with it was, is that there's not sort of the right now, it doesn't seem like it would be a feasible thing and we would just get it shot down by PPB if they were saying they could give the simple answer of we don't have the funds and we can't allocate it accordingly. That's why I'm worried about. I, I agree wholeheartedly that PS3s should be a, an alternative available for the community uh, with de when dealing with low level crimes, um, similar to the Portland Street response. I just think that there's sort of, I don't think the time is now in the sense uh, it's, of it's how long it took Portland Street response to sort of erect from where they were initially. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I see your point completely. You know, when's, when's a good time for this? The, the interesting thing is that I, I've never actually heard anybody shoot it down. I mean, I, I've spoken with um, uh, PPB on this. I've spoken with neighborhood associations. I've spoken with, um, you know, uh, in, in our groups and, and TAC as well. And there's, there's a lot of people that think this is a great idea. It's just how to make it happen, you know, how to increase it. Um, and that, like I said, I have a, a friend who needed some help and a PS3 came along and then she called me up right afterwards and was like, yeah, I had a really good experience with the PS3s and described how they were dressed and all that kind of stuff. So it, it seems like there's a lot of um, energy behind this, uh, it, it, but, how do we get that energy to actually mean something, I think is the, the key point here. Uh, Luck, Anna. You find my mute button here. Um, yeah, so just saw like some of the comments about um, increasing the PV budget. I don't know if you just spoke about that or not, if you could just touch on that. And then also would be curious to just hear any uh, PPB comment on their thoughts uh, who are who are attending here? Any their thoughts on this recommendation? All right, thank you. And yeah, I, I touched upon the uh, the, the budget, um, and and once again, it, it was something that uh, I thought would be necessary in order to get a program that I think everybody likes um, to actually grow and um, prove its worth. I mean, not only is it involving hiring people, I think. PS3's uh, salary is fifty to sixty thousand dollars plus the van, plus the training and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, certainly it adds up quickly. Um, but to actually do studies on what more they could do out there, what more calls they can respond to, you know, that's a lengthy sort of thing that needs to go through. Um, so yeah, that's that's the crux of the matter. You know, is this something that's important? And if it's important, is it something that we feel should be funded? Um, and I've heard that. I'll also note facilitation wise, we are kind of almost at time. So I know Anne has the question, uh, but we have to make sure we can have time for the next agenda item in vote. So this might be able to be the last question. Hey, I was also was asking if PBB had comment on this. Okay, yeah, um, I just meant after that as well. So. Uh, Anne? Oh, did you want to ask if PBB wanted to comment? Yeah. Uh, well or how That's fine, and then I can, I just have a quick question. Okay, and I, I, I do, since uh, this is a community forum, I want to also make sure we got community members, uh, community comments as well, but um, is there anybody from PPB that would like to speak to this whatsoever? Uh, I'd be happy to, if you'd like. Uh, yes, Chief Davis, thank you. So we are obviously in support of the program and we, are working on an analysis of how much work uh, the PS3 program has has gotten has done so far, so that we can quantify how much to expect of more of them. Um, we're working on that. I've seen some preliminary results of that. I would anticipate that we'll be able to talk about what we found publicly once we've finalized everything, but. Uh, we're certainly in support of expanding the program. What I will tell you is that um, it's it's a it's a both and thing. Um, yes, there is a lot of work that 
that PS3s can do in the community. There's also a lot of demand though for police bureau service that they can't meet. Um, and the cost of that program is a little bit more than we originally anticipated it to be. Um, so it's, it's a little bit less than a police officer, but it's still, you know, it still costs money. And with our budget being the way it is, um, I would expect that in our budget um, proposal for the mayor's office this year that we will probably try to have some number of added PS3s in an ad package. But first, we've got a 5% budget cut exercise to get through. And I absolutely have to be able to provide police officers in emergencies where police officers are necessary. And our staffing levels right now with, with for emergencies and then for investigative work that has to be done by sworn police officers, um, our, our capacity is just not up to the demand even for that work right now. Um, so certainly expanding the PS3 program to take more and more of those lower acuity calls would be uh, would be a great idea and, and we would be all for it. I just, if I'm gonna make a budget proposal, I have to be able to forecast what the city gets for its investment. And so we're working on that piece right now. Thank you, Chief Davis. I, um, I know I mentioned uh, Sean Campbell, but I don't see him on the list here. So maybe he didn't want to make any public comments about this, but um, Anne. Um, yeah, um, Vadim, um, in an earlier uh, presentation to the Settlement and Policy Committee in the, in the recommendation you had put in asking um, for additional funds from the city to fund this program. And I noticed you have removed that. So from this uh, recommendation that, that you have tonight, I'm just wondering again, um, how, how would it be paid? How, and we have heard, I have heard, um, and we have seen uh, the citizens of our, of our city, um, they want to cut police. So I'm just wondering how, how we would, how this program would be expanded um, in this time. Uh, to, to answer your question um, most directly, I, I don't know. Um, it, I, the, the city would have to either move funding or change funding or, or what have you. I, I don't know how the police pay for really anything other than the funding that the city allows for them. That's the best thing. Yeah. We, we have to move to the vote. So if you could read that one line description before we start the vote. I'm sorry. Oh, excuse me. We also, I want to expand it beyond PSEP comment. I, it was sort of open at that point, but we'll continue. If there's any other comments from not PSEP and now over the rest of the community, and then we'll do the vote. Apologies. You got my mic? You got it? Go ahead. Okay. Oops. But please, yeah. I will just sort of say for time's sake, if you could keep it brief. Thank you. And then I also see Cop Watch. I see that. My comment and question is simple. I would really like to see the PS, I would like the recommendation to include and like to see the PS3s used to stop traffic when the fire bureau calls and says we're laying hoses across the road. We need traffic stopped. That to me is one of the worst uses of resources for our police officers. Um, so I would like to see like some of those sort of mundane things included too, besides besides the other stuff, if that makes any sense. That's that's it. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, I do. I've typed it to Patrick. Yeah, I was wondering if it is funded, what what stops the uh, Portland police from taking the officers and rolling the money back into line officers in a couple of years? That has to do with uh, the budgeted positions. You can't do that because basically, and to be just brief, because when you 
add positions, you add two things, position authority and the money for to pay for those positions. The position authority that council would give us would be for PS3s, not for police officers. And it takes council approval to, to get authority for different positions. Thank you, Chris. You bet. And uh, Mr. Handelman, I saw a stack, which I assume is a, a, you wanted to make a comment, is that correct? Yeah, well, just to um, piggyback on something that Barbara from our group put in the chat, I'm going to put uh, a specific amendment I'm going to propose to your uh, proposal, <laughs> um, which is to cut the words through additional city funding. And uh, as I also pointed out in the chat, if you take the empty positions at the police bureau and you don't fill them, you could hire a whole bunch of public safety support specialists instead of hiring full officers. So if you're working around the budget and apply to the city council and ask for more of these positions instead of asking for more officers, you can take the same money and make and stretch it and have more unarmed um, people in the community and fewer cops. So that's uh, that's my proposal right there to cut those words. Are those, Vadim, are those both amendments friendly or? You know, um... I, I don't know whether the second part, I, I know exactly what that means as far as that, but there is quite a few comments here about funding and so on. Um, I, I, I would agree with cutting out the, uh, the last part of the sentence through additional city funding and just leaving it to um, expanding the PS3 program. And then when the budget people start working on it, they can maybe try to figure it out. And then same thing with the backfills and all that kind of stuff. I assume like if there's a, a need to expand it then the people working on it can um, work through it. So I'm fine with that. So the, the last sentence on the first page will read, um, the community served by PPB would benefit from the expansion of the PS3 program period instead of additional funding. Okay. Any additional community comments? Okay, and then Vadim, can you just uh, read the summary of the recommendation before we vote? The Portland Committee on Community Engaged Policing supports the recommendation in the Training Advisory Council with input from the Portland Police Bureau Training Division, as well as community feedback individually and through organizations such as Portland Cop Watch. Mr. Dan Handelman, I hope you agree with me on this. If not, please speak up. That the public support safety support specialist program be expanded. Okay, great. And so with that, we'll start a vote. Um, go to Elliot. Um, so, for me, the issue of the budget is crucial since it's not answered in the proposal. And since the police have made it clear that this would result in an expansion of the PV budget, I'm voting now. Uh, Lakiana. I thought we, we took that line out about the, the budget being publicly funded. No, the line is out, but given what the Portland police have said they will not use the money from the police bureau to fill these positions. This would be an, an no. add to the PPP budget um, from their perspective, and that's With likely the, if they get if the council accepts their ten, their request for an, for a increase in funding. That's sort of a contingency, right? So, given that the the proposal does not speak specifically to where the funds are coming from. Um, my feeling now is that it's likely to be a net addition, um, which I'm, I'm I okay. have a reason to vote against, for me to vote against. Whoa. Is that something we can add? I hate to hold up the vote, but um, is that something we can add to this that we want it to um, come from current funding and not from uh, public funding or other sources? And, and this is one of those areas where I think that, as was mentioned, you know, the 
city officials can make a determination as to what they want to do with this as far as the recommendation goes. Um, this is not something that this will go to um, the mayors, the police chief, and then they'll have their budget discussions. Um, if we're not, if we're going to say that adding money is not something we want to do, um, I'll let them at least decide based on whatever community input or otherwise as to how they want to handle that situation. I think I would be more comfortable letting people who are doing the budget decide uh, or voting on the budget in a few months with City Hall um, decide how they want to. You don't trust them to decide. Um, okay, but it was okay. Really well, we have to continue the vote. I'm going to abstain from this vote. Okay. I don't feel like I have enough information to make a uh, the best decision that I want to at this point. Thank you. Um, you have no an abstention. I ask all folks mute their mics until it's their turn. Uh, Anne. I um, agree with Elliot. I'm concerned about um, PPB asking for additional money for this. Uh, so I vote no. Okay, thank you, Amy. Okay, I wanna put this out there for everybody because folks are thinking in the moment and I think forward, we do not know the capacity of the analysis yet as to whether or not this could or could not be funded in the future. I think if we move the recommendation into a conversation, it could very easily, once someone talks about the benefits, maybe someone else might decide that it's now worth the investment. So I'm gonna vote yes, because I believe in futuristic. We, all, we don't know what the future holds, so maybe someone will find this um, more effective when the analysis is finished about its effectiveness. I think we're saying no too soon, so I'm gonna vote yes. Okay, thank you, Amy. Uh, Britt? Yeah, I, I actually am also going to vote yes. I have many of the same concerns that uh, Elliot and others have expressed, um, but I would also like to move this forward on the merits of the program. And either way, I know it's gonna be a long process to figure out the budget, so I just, um, I, I know that we all will be involved in those discussions as much as possible, and hopefully that will lead to a uh, lead to a good outcome. Thank you, and Yolanda. I vote yes, without an explanation. Thank you. Um, if she's not here, but Dean. I vote yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, did Jamari get on the line? I don't know. No, I don't see it. Okay. Here earlier. I don't think he's here now. Okay, cool. Um, Alana, I don't think that made it, made it either. Zineb? So I would just say that I really wanted to hear some additional information. And that's why I attended the, well, I attended the director's meeting for a different um, recommendation. However, I learned um, at that meeting about some the PS3 and my concern about the youth aspect of not having any information related to um, how youth and children would be treated is important to me because I know a lot of um, BIPOC children are harmed um, either way um, in these types of institutions and I don't I don't really understand about like the question about our PS3s just working their way up to become um, police officers or are they being trained differently to think differently to act differently and to also you know take different actions um and then i also when chief davis mentioned that there wasn't a preliminary results and reports available um, about the capacity of the ps3 i have a concern about that Ninety thousand was a low number based on what you said, Vadim, in your report about how many cases 10 people could get. And that could turn into other issues that we've already seen um, in, in workspaces, um, especially when it comes to mental health um, and being able to um, deal with those things. And so, um, and then based on the number of people currently on a team and also the type of work that will be required by the PS3, 
you know, with a strong budget to support that. Um, not having an outline understanding of what they would do while yes, it's, 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 I want to say yes to a PS3. However, there's just still not, not enough information. And also when I asked about the youth and I thought that was gonna be something that um, was gonna be looked into, I really would have, if that if you had some information about that, I would at least said, you know, possibly maybe to, to more listening to this um, recommendation. So no, thank you. Thank you, and I vote no. I'm not going to keep my response long, but main, two main reasons. One, because it's housed with MPBB, and two, for the reasons Zena said, which no one else really mentioned, which is that they did not specify how PP, how these officers are trained separately from sworn officers, and you can still exert lethal force without a gun, um, especially if you're trained like traditional officers are trained in militant ways. Uh, and so I'm not done the count for it so let me do that but elliot i we also and said uh it would be okay if we deferred the last item so we can but do you want to introduce them Anne? i think that might be helpful while i try to calculate for the last 10. i've calculated the votes it's oh perfect four yeses okay. four no's one abstention so and and let me uh let me just before we cut it because it's it's um that the tide right now this happened before as well uh, with the abstentions, um, I do want to make one final sales pitch. You know, we're here to try to make uh, the interaction between community members and PPP better. Um, I understand that there's some questions that have not been answered by this, and it was not meant to answer all the questions. Um, I think that we need to have unarmed individuals on there responding to calls. And if anybody here um, thinks that there's a better way than this to do that, um, I'm all open to suggestions. I think this has been discussed for a couple of years um, and it's working and it seems like this is a way to uh, get help to community members without having armed individuals uh, go there. Um, the funding issues can be worked out by other people. The training issues can be worked out. The training advisory council made a recommendation that's fairly lengthy on training as well. And there, the training division has provided feedback on that. Um, certainly, there's going to be questions that are not answered, but I think that's baked into this recommendation, which is to have the PSEP right? as well as the training advisor. We, we, we have to, that. for the dean for time's sake, we can't. So, we, we and so to. I just want to say, Lakayana, any chance you want to change your vote to yes or no, one way or the other? And just I, I do, because I'm not a fan of abstentions, especially after a lengthy thing like this. So I'm going to vote yes. I think that um, this is not the end all be all of it. And I think that there'll be ample time for PSEP to work on other components of it. And like I said, I'm not a fan of abstentions. I didn't think it was gonna be this close. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, it passes. Um, if, if Ellie did the math right in that. <laughs> uh, Patrick asked for a, a roll call vote. And so just to be clear, this is who I have as yes, Britt, Yolanda, Vadim, Amy, and then Lakiana, who changed his vote, and no, Anne, Elliot, Zainab, and Tachi. So five to four. Thank you. Um, so Anne, you said we'll just sort of save that, I guess, for March. Zainab, I see it. Yes. Did you want to say anything on that? But and Zainab, I know your question as well. Yeah, I can say quickly. Um, PSEP has decided to review directives. Uh, we did a, a vote on a policy of doing that, a procedure rather of doing that. Um, we ran out of time at our settlement uh, meeting this month. And so we were hoping to get to it tonight. Um, I wanna invite everyone to come to our settlement meeting next month where that will be the only thing on the agenda. Is that correct, Vadim? That is correct. Good. So then we will have ample time to talk about it. You can review the um, directives that are attached and my analysis piece. And I hope you join us next month. Thank you, Anne. <clears throat> um, Zina, have you had a comment? Yeah, I do. And it was really based on Vadim's sales speech he said um, he had. Um, I just hope that you will work at getting this recommendation um, to a to listen to what was shared by those who did say no, and hopefully keep that in mind when you you go to edit or review um, this recommendation because I do believe it still needs work. 
Um, but again, <laughs> we'll see. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Zainab. Okay. Um, and with that, I'm going to close out tonight with the poem from Jamari. Uh, fortunately, Jamari could not make it with us, but he gave me permission to share it on his behalf. Um, and this is from Lakiana's Orders Bond's new poetry book, which y'all should go check out and purchase. You can throw the link in the chat if you want, Lakiana. <laughs> um, so here it is. And, and this will close us out and also just ring in uh, the importance of Black History Month and the importance of Black stories and Black poets. Uh, Rooted Evil by Jamari Ethereal. The blacker the berry, the sweeter the juice. But hate is deep in the roots. We are taught to love one another, but hate is easier to do. We war with each other over things we don't do. We are demonized for being dark as night, but we still fight for basic rights. We are told to stop resisting, but they don't understand our fight. We want dark to be all right. The blacker the berry, the sweeter the juice. And with that, I close out to this uh, Portland Committee on Community Engaged Policing full board meeting for February. And thank you everyone so much for showing up and providing your great feedback and, and all your important opinions um, and perspectives on these important issues. So thank you and have a wonderful Tuesday afternoon. Good night. Thanks everyone for attending. Yeah, thanks everyone, see you next time.